when an anomaly is first detected by an SCP Foundation field agent, it's up to the Foundation's mobile task forces to tag and bag the impossible entities before they can do any more harm. Sometimes these retrievals are uneventful, other times, not so much. Especially when they're dealing with brutal forces of nature, like SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy, a creature that, from the very first interaction with the Foundation, had a reputation for being dangerous and needed to be feared. A series of vague sightings and mysterious disappearances up in the frosty mountains of the Yukon first sparked the Foundation's interest. When they were certain that they had an anomaly on their hands, two retrieval teams, Zulu 9A and Zulu 9B, were dispatched to secure and contain the entity. Zulu 9A took the lead in a heavy duty chopper, equipped with 50 caliber GAU 19 heavy machine guns and carrying an AT-4 anti-tank launcher, they were prepared for anything, or so they thought, as they established a visual on SCP-096 while two clicks away from the target. They couldn't get a clear line of sight on the creature, but it appeared to be stationary, docile, and was making no attempt to flee. Piece of cake, right? Little did they know that SCP-096 was just looking away from them. If it was facing towards them, it'd be a whole different horror story as Zulu 9A were about to find out. The team landed their helicopter next to the creature and were shocked to see that it was completely naked in spite of the sub-zero temperatures all around them. The creature was unnaturally thin, as though it had been starved for weeks, with bone white skin and unnaturally long limbs. The team guessed that the creature's arms must have been at least 1.5 meters long, but its docile nature and insubstantial body mass gave the impression that it wouldn't prove too difficult to contain. That is, until they saw its face. Zulu 9A's captain was the lone survivor of the incident, as he was lucky enough to be looking away when the creature turned towards his team. The rest of the squad ended up staring eye to eye with SCP-096, and from that moment on, wasn't docile anymore. The creature began to whimper, then cry, then sob uncontrollably in a way that sounded eerily human. This sudden change in temperament startled the rest of Zulu 9A, and they opened fire on the creature. Under the hail of gunfire, SCP-096 entered a murderous frenzy and began tearing into the hapless squad of soldiers. While its flesh and organs did seem to take damage as a result of the barrage of 50 caliber rounds from the helicopter-mounted machine guns, its skeletal structure remained intact and it continued its onslaught, tearing the team limb from limb even after they'd blown practically all the flesh from the creature. The AT-4 anti-tank launcher proved equally ineffective at stopping SCP-096 while it was in attack mode, and it was only after slaughtering the entire team that it returned to its docile state. Nobody knows exactly what the creature did to Zulu 9A after the gunfire started, but no trace of the team was left behind. Zulu 9B touched down soon after, and with a grave warning from the captain not to look at the creature's face, they were finally able to subdue it. A bag was placed over SCP-096's face, which seemed to soothe it enough to move it to a nearby Foundation facility. Little did they know, they just obtained one of the deadliest SCPs of all time. And while it may have been under lock and key for now, it seemed inevitable that it would get out and cause more violence and chaos. Research and containment procedures for the SCP-096 were put under the command of Dr. Dan, a senior researcher at the site. It was his job to find out exactly what this being was capable of, and the more he tested, the more he realized that they were dealing with something truly terrifying. Disposable D-Class personnel were used to figure out exactly what it was that caused the creature to enter its attack mode. Just as it had during the initial retrieval mission, SCP-096 went berserk when any of the attending personnel saw its face. In this stage, it would enter a period of considerable and unstoppable distress for one to two minutes, covering its face and wailing loudly. When the period of distress ended, the creature would mercilessly slaughter every D-Class that had seen its face, and just like with Zulu 9A, no trace of their bodies would be left behind. Dr. Den was horrified and intrigued by this phenomenon. The creature killed anyone that saw its face directly, but could the same be said for indirect depictions of the creature's face? such as images and videos. Dr. Dan was desperate to find out. More D-Class personnel were brought in to test this, to frightening results. 
Dr. Dan found that the creature did indeed still enter attack mode when people saw pictures and videos of SCP-096's face. The creature seemed to have an innate sense of when people were viewing these representations, even when it should have had no conceivable way of knowing. It didn't matter how far away or how many barriers were in place between the viewer and the creature, the attack mode would still activate. And once it did, it seemed as though nothing could stop the creature from hunting down the one who saw its face. With all of this new data, special containment procedures were devised to keep the creature safely under lock and key. Its cell was a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter airtight steel cube, fitted with advanced pressure sensors and laser detectors to ensure that SCP-096 remained in its cell without risking anyone having visual contact with the creature's face. All cameras and video equipment were strictly forbidden, and weekly checks for any cracks or holes in the containment cell were mandatory. Of course, none of this would stop the creature if anyone somehow saw its face. In order to solve that little problem, Dr. Dan would need to continue his research. To find a method of subverting the creature's deadly glance, they needed to know exactly what they were dealing with. But how could they, when even a glance at a photo or video of the being meant certain death? A potential solution was proposed, creating an artistic representation of the creature's face, something that hadn't yet been attempted. But how would they achieve such a feat? Simple. They'd procure a D-Class prisoner with some artistic talent, and they found one who had been a tattoo artist before becoming a Foundation guinea pig. Dr. Dan formulated an ingenious plan for keeping this D-Class alive for long enough to accurately draw an image of SCP-096's face. He would be placed in a bathysphere diving bell several kilometers underwater and tens of kilometers away from the containment cell where the SCP was being held. The D-Class was made to look at a photograph of the creature's face and then replicate that image in a pencil sketch. Dr. Dan first confirmed that the creature's attack mode is only activated by the creature's face by having the D-Class look at a series of photos of the SCP's body parts, one by one, finally finishing with its face. The D-Class began drawing and even remarked on how creepy the SCP's facial features were, despite not knowing the deadly context. Meanwhile, back in its containment cell, SCP-096 sensed someone viewing its face and entered its inconsolable crying state followed by its attack mode. It broke out of containment easily and began making a beeline for the D-Class, traversing the miles between it and its prey. The D-Class didn't know it as he locked the finished drawing into a separate, autonomous submersible, but he was already dead. As the drawing made its way up to a researcher on the surface, SCP-096 dived into the water and started swimming down towards the artist. Minutes later, the bathysphere was breached, and the D-Class was torn to shreds. SCP-096 was recaptured without issue by surface recovery team Foxtrot 303A, and further testing on the drawing showed that artistic representations of SCP-096's face were in fact harmless. From this experience, we now know that the creature has a gaunt face with totally white eyes, possibly indicating blindness and a grossly extended jaw. Nevertheless, Dr. Dan was adamant that SCP-096 was too dangerous to be left alive and requested permission from the upper echelons of the Foundation to terminate the creature by any means necessary. However, the doctor's request would fall on deaf ears until it all started with a seemingly innocent image. While it's now been redacted for your safety, the black speck inside the yellow circle was once a minuscule image of SCP-096 taken unknowingly in the 1990s by a semi-professional mountaineer. One day they were looking at old photographs when his eyes passed over the tiny speck without even noticing that he had seen anything. But SCP-096 noticed and began entering its attack mode. It tore through its steel containment unit like tissue paper, causing the release of a nerve agent that killed a number of attending Foundation staff. The monster then fled the base and began pursuing its prey, with Mobile Task Force Tau-1 in hot pursuit. Dr. Oleksy, who was helping to manage the site where the SCP was contained, was in dismay over the situation. Dr. Dan was out of the country at the time, trying to discover more about the creature's origins. However, he did leave the Mobile Task Force with a new secret weapon against the rampaging Shy Guy, Project Scramble. Scramble were state-of-the-art goggles featuring a new technology created by Dr. Dan, which, using artistic renditions of 096's facial features, could detect and scramble the features of SCP-096 into an unrecognizable form, preventing the normally deadly effect of gazing upon its face. In theory, this would allow MTF Tau-1 to engage safely with 096 once its prey had been eliminated and bring it back into containment. 
but disaster struck on two fronts. First, the prey in question was located in a population center, creating the potential for a huge loss of life. And the second bigger problem was that the scramble technology didn't work, as stray pixels of the creature's face would reach the eyes of the task force before the internal microprocessor had time to scramble them. The mission turned into a death sentence, as SCP-096 slaughtered almost the entire task force, as well as a number of civilians in town, including an infant and its entire family. It was a monumental disaster, made even worse by a final revelation. Dr. Dan and Dr. Alexei had themselves facilitated the entire containment breach and allowed the resulting massacre to happen. With Dr. Dan hoping it would be enough motivation for Foundation Command to greenlight his research into destroying the creature. Anything that would give him the opportunity to kill this thing would be worth the bloodshed. His plan worked, and the SCP Foundation saw it his way, approving his request to neutralize SCP-096. However, success comes at a cost for Dr. Dan. Once he figures out a way to finally kill the creature, though done in his line of duty, he himself will be terminated by the Foundation for his crimes against humanity. But considering how much damage SCP-096 is capable of causing if it ever got to a major population center, or even worse, was ever caught on camera and broadcast to a worldwide audience, the doctor himself would likely deem his own death a justifiable cost. To this day, the Foundation is researching ways to kill the creature, and they're still looking for their silver bullet. And the pressure is on. They hadn't known about the seemingly innocent picture that sparked the last containment breach, the one taken decades ago, in which the Shy Guy had only occupied four tiny pixels. Four tiny pixels that resulted in multiple innocent lives lost. So be careful where you look, because who knows how many other photos of the creature are lurking out there. Photos with an innocent dot in the background. Your eyes glance over it, not even noticing the little blip until you hear a distant wailing that seems to be getting closer and closer and closer. And then, it's already too late. This video is about two things. The first is SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy, a horrific monster who murders anyone and anything unfortunate enough to look at its face, directly or through photos or videos. The second is you because we asked you for your favorite questions, theories, and hypothetical situations involving 096. We even asked if you thought someone would be safe from 096 on the moon, and you delivered. If you haven't watched our first video on the infamous Shy Guy, we recommend checking that out first, but feel free to stick around even if you haven't. First of all, let's take a look at the questions you had about the SCP Foundation's most dangerous introvert and see if we can't find some answers. How close would you have to be to trigger it? Like, if it was 5 kilometers away, would it still count? The short answer is that 096's homicidal rage can be triggered from pretty much any distance. We'll get into some of the potentially crazy extents of this later on, but if you see the shy guy's face while you're sharing a dimension with him, you're in serious trouble. People who viewed the creature's face in different countries or even miles underwater have met gruesome ends. Five kilometers would definitely not keep you safe. What were his origins and how strong is he compared to SCP-682? The origins of SCP-096 are still shrouded in mystery. All we know for sure is that he was discovered by the Foundation in a snowy mountainous region. As for physical durability, he's about even with 682 as both survived their encounter. We know 682 has the psychological advantage though, as 096 has been terrified of the lizard ever since they met in cross-testing. However, you could argue that 096 is technically more dangerous, since unlike 682, 096 has never been pacified before killing its intended target while on a rampage. If he goes into an unstoppable attack mode when someone sees his face, shouldn't you not show his face in the thumbnail? Thankfully, according to the official documents, artistic representations like paintings or digitally drawn YouTube thumbnails have no effect. Only actual photographs or videos of the creature can be deadly. So you're safe. Unless we decide to do a 096 face reveal to celebrate our next 100,000 subscribers, of course. This leads us to our next question. If it attacks you when you look at it, then how did the scientist draw the picture of the thing without looking at it? That's a good question, and also one that occurred to the Foundation scientists who came up with an extremely elaborate solution. 
They put a D-Class tattoo artist inside a diving bell miles underwater and had him unseal a photograph of the creature before drawing a copy. This copy was then released from the diving bell in a sealed container before 096 inevitably got to the poor D-Class. Does the shy guy have to be viewed through a good quality image to enter a rage state? Unfortunately, no. Even the most poorly rendered or minuscule image of 096's face is a death sentence. One of the most infamous incidents resulted from a man seeing a small dot that was only a few pixels wide in a photo from an old ski trip. The dot was 096, taken from a mile away. No true image of 096 is safe, regardless of size. In some canons, despite 096 being referred to as indestructible, the Foundation managed to terminate it after many attempts and even more bureaucracy. How did they do it? While a lot of 096's body has been blown away by conventional arms fire, its hyper-tough skeleton is what has given it such an indestructible reputation. In one tale, though, Foundation researchers actually used this to their advantage and employed the use of the neck-snapping killer sculpture SCP-173. After using 173 to damage 096's bones, powerful acid was injected into the skeleton, destroying it from within. Though of course, this isn't the official ending of the 096 story, because the SCP Foundation doesn't have a single unifying canon. That's enough questions. Now it's time for you to school us. Let's look at some of your favorite theories about the Shy Guy, starting with... I sometimes like to imagine that 096 is nice, but he can't control when someone sees him and after he kills the person he starts to cry because he didn't want to kill them. There is actually some evidence to suggest that SCP-096 might not want to kill. A great example of this is its cross-test with SCP-978, a camera which reveals the deepest desires of whoever or whatever is in its photos. The photo it took of 096 showed that it had completely disappeared from the photo showing its deepest desire was to just be invisible and unseen. Maybe it wants to disappear because it doesn't want to hurt anybody. Regarding the moon question, I think SCP-096 would probably stay in that hostile state until you came back, at which point it would promptly rip you to shreds and do whatever it does to your mutilated corpse. Based on what we know about prior 096 incidents, this feels incredibly likely. It's also possible that it might enter its docile state, before becoming aggressive again when you return to its murder range. You really don't want to find out either way. He can just jump to the moon easy. He does squats and containment all the time. While its scrawny physique doesn't make it seem like 096 understands the concept of exercise, there aren't any cameras in 096's cell, so technically we can't prove it isn't doing squats to pass the time in there. I really doubt a blind person would be safe from his effect, since 096 has the IQ of a newborn baby. I think he will count it as looking at him. This is an interesting theory. However, seeing as 096 is able to sense when people see its face from entire continents away, the way it knows if you can see its face might be a little more psychic in nature. Therefore, it's probable that it wouldn't mistakenly kill someone who hasn't actually seen its face, such as a person who is blind. To deal with him, in my opinion, simply freeze him, either in space or in the mountains. His body shuts down and when looked at it, it will not react correctly. It is simply asleep. While we don't know how SCP-096 would react to a zero-G environment, for a creature that's always nude, it seems extremely tolerant to the cold. When it was first found, it was lurking in icy mountains, and a Foundation agent commented on the fact it wasn't even shivering despite the incredibly low temperatures. But who knows if there's a temperature out there that's too low even for the shy guy. If someone looks at it in China and it's in the US, then you get on its back, you'll get a free piggyback ride to China. It's a free trip to China and all it costs is a human life. That's my theory. Technically, it'd be at the cost of two human lives, unless you wore a diving suit with plenty of oxygen. 096 has proven to be an extremely proficient swimmer, but you'd have to maintain your grip across the entire Pacific Ocean while it journeys to China. In other words, it's technically possible, but we here at SCP Explained would rather pay for the round-trip flight. To each their own, though. But that's enough theories for now. Let's move on to the main event. Hypotheticals. You pose some great possible scenarios involving SCP-096. 
So we're going to see if we can find the answers. What would happen if someone looked at a picture of it while in or before entering another SCP's pocket dimension or mirror dimension? There aren't any canon examples to prove either way, but if there's any kind of consistent entry point into this dimension, it's likely that 096 would find a way to follow you in. If not, it's very possible that it may just wait for you to eventually return before bringing the metaphorical hammer down on you. So technically, if you were pulled into the old man's pocket dimension and he closed the portal, you'd be safe from 096. But then you've got a whole other problem to deal with. What happens if a person sees his face and gets their memory of the creature wiped? Considering how good the Foundation seems to be at wiping people's memories and their access to amnestics, if this worked, they probably would have made it standard procedure by now so it's unlikely. What happens if a person looked at it and that person then went on a plane? Or just staying in the air or space, what would it do? 096 has shown the ability to jump up and destroy low-flying aircraft. But otherwise, it's likely that the creature would probably run to a point directly below you and remain there until you touch back down. Since you'll need food and water at some point and aircrafts need fuel, you'd probably just be prolonging the inevitable. What if the young girl was around it so it tried to attack her but died trying? This is another interesting possibility. SCP-053 is a girl capable of causing homicidal urges, but causes fatal heart attacks in those who attack her. While we can't know for sure how a meeting between 096 and 053 would go, we can use her encounter with 682 as a potential template. Aggressive SCPs like the hard-to-kill reptile, perhaps having an innate knowledge of the danger that comes from attacking 053, tend to become strangely docile around her. It's possible that 096 would do the same. Would we be able to control SCP-096 with the help of SCP-035? The Possessive Mask, aka SCP-035, is undeniably a lot more intelligent than 096 and has even been shown to respond to reason on occasion. It's also been able to control almost every other entity it's been placed on. The problem is, if the mask was placed on 096 and it was somehow effective, the result may be even more dangerous than 096, an intelligent monster with an indestructible and highly dangerous body. There's no telling whether 035 would slowly break down 096 into sludge the way it does to humans, in which case we would be left with an immortal 096-035 combo. So maybe it's best that we never find out. If someone were to be in the infinite Ikea and looked at a picture of its face, could it finally be contained? And if someone else looked at a picture of it outside of the infinite Ikea, could it escape and kill them? If so, how long would it take it? This is a great question. And while the infinite Ikea is a terrifying maze, SCP-096 has an advantage here that we don't. Not only can it rip through anything in the way with its super strength, it has an innate sense of where its victim is. Therefore, regardless of whether you're inside or out, SCP-096 will still come straight to you to exact your horrible fate. But at least you can enjoy the meatballs while you wait, right? And finally, what would happen if 096 were led into a room full of mirrors and allowed or made to look at its own face? Would it smash the mirrors or try to rip itself to pieces? This is still a hotly debated issue to this day, which, thanks to the no-canon nature of the SCP Foundation, does not have a definitive answer. Some theorize that this would at least be an effective deterrent against SCP-096, while others suggest that it wouldn't be effective because many believe that 096 is actually blind and thus cannot see its own face. It can only sense when other people see it. Again, we don't quite know for sure, but it's likely to remain one of the most contentious issues around the Shy Guy for a long time to come. As you walk down the halls of the SCP Foundation Site-19, peeking in the various windows at the anomalies contained there, you might catch a glimpse of a dark figure bent over a table, tinkering away like an artisan in his workshop. A vintage black apothecary bag sits next to him, open, and if you stop and watch for a while, you'll see him pull all manner of tools out of it. Impossibly large tools, things that shouldn't fit in such a small bag, a bone saw, an IV stand, jars of fluorescent liquids, and needles the length of your forearm. 
You shouldn't be surprised. This is a place for impossible things, after all. Still, it's a curious sight, the shadowy man working so diligently, so quietly, focused singularly on his craft, whatever that might be. Only one thing could distract him from his efforts, you. He feels your gaze on him, and he looks up, dark eyes glittering from behind a beaked ceramic mask. He reminds you of an illustration you once saw in a book about the Black Death, the gear the plague doctors wore while treating patients on their deathbeds. Hello. He greets you in a friendly, heavily accented voice. His eyes crinkle beneath the mask, and if you could see his mouth, you know he'd be smiling. How are you today, dear fellow? Are you feeling quite well? He takes a step toward the window, stretching out one gloved hand, and you suddenly realize that you can't see where the mask ends and his skin begins. It's not a mask, but a part of his face. This is no ordinary man. Do you require help? I can examine you, he offers. Palm pressed flat against the glass, a chill runs up your spine, and you realize that you should definitely not take him up on his offer. No matter how friendly he seems, how good his intentions may be, you wouldn't want to let the plague doctor treat you. He sat in his containment cell, fidgeting with his favorite scalpel. He dragged it over the surface of his work table, back and forth, listening to the sound it made. They had tried to confiscate his table, his tools. The guards had quickly learned that he had more of them in his bag. They tried to take away his bag from him, but, well, that didn't go over too well for anyone involved. So he was allowed to keep it, to fashion himself a makeshift laboratory in his lonely little cell. There was a time where they had given him test subjects, fresh corpses from the morgue for him to dissect and research. There was a time when the doctors here would come to speak with him, talking of cryptobiology and the pestilence he had dedicated himself to fighting. Those days were long gone. He had hidden away pieces of the corpses, tissue samples in jars of formaldehyde he could pull out when the monotony became too much. But the days of fresh materials, of enlightened discourse with other men and women of science, were over. How he missed those days, the chance to work with others as he once had. What had he done wrong? All he did was treat the sick. Sure, they didn't always understand their illness, didn't want to receive their medicine, but that wasn't a choice for the patient to make. That should have been up to the physician. Perhaps they didn't trust his expertise, didn't see how his work served the greater good. Like those who watched Jonas Salk invent the polio vaccine, or Louis Pasteur rid milk of bacteria, they were confused by the advanced scientific practices and feared that which they did not understand. He could forgive them for their ignorance. He was magnanimous that way. If only they would let him out of this infernal room, he could prove his work's worth to them. He could cure them all, begin a new era of wellness and peace worldwide. He didn't exactly sleep, but when he rested on his little cot in the corner of the room, he dreamed of that future, of a world healed by his touch. A knock at the door stirred him from his reverie. Someone, someone was at the door of his containment cell. He glanced at the little window and saw a guard there with a tray of food. He greeted the man with an enthusiastic wave. Sustenance. He didn't require the food for survival, of course, but it helped his mind work more efficiently. It reminded him of a time before these fluorescent lights and these same four walls of crusty bread with fresh butter by the banks of the Seine. The little slot opened in the door and the tray was shoved through. There was bread, just as he hoped, a small dish of butter, a pot of jam, and a cup of tea still seeming. He picked up the cup at first, taking a deep breath. Ah, an herbal blend with fresh lavender. Lovely. He couldn't see the guard through the window anymore, but he called out to him just the same. Thank you for the libations. He still had his manners after all, even in confinement. He wished he could have gotten a better look at the man, seen the pallor of his complexion, a tremor in his hand. He thought he had spotted sweat beating on his forehead. Could he be ill? The case required further examination to be certain. He sighed, clutching the cup of tea tighter in frustration. Why wouldn't they just let him work? Why must they scream at the sight of his efforts, flee from his instruments? It didn't seem fair. Still, the pursuit of science rarely was a glamorous one. He had learned as much over the centuries. One day, though, history would look back on him kindly. Of this, 
he could be certain. He was just settling in and beginning to spread butter across the admittedly stale bread, when a horrible sound shook him to attention. He had heard the noise before, though he had never seen its source. It was an ear-splitting scream, a wail of pure agony like the sound of a wounded wild animal. He had heard many, many screams during his life, from patients and those who stood in the way of his work, but until he had been brought into custody of the Foundation, he had never heard a scream quite like this one. It was pure rage, devastation, and suffering mixed together, wet with tears and loud enough to rip through human vocal folds. Whatever was crying out, it was no mere man. More screams answered it, and these were very much human. These sounds were more familiar to him. Shrieks of pain, of fear, of desperate but futile attempts to escape. Then the meaty thud of bodies falling to the floor, of torn off limbs hitting walls and windows, a loud crash, and the sound of something large moving quite quickly through the halls. Scientific curiosity got the better of the doctor and he found himself moving back to his little window, face pressed to the glass so hard his beak nearly cracked it. He couldn't see much of anything, just guards running down the hall, weapons drawn. He saw one of them fire, heard the gunshot ring out, but what was he firing at? Then he saw it, a pale blur darting past the door. Whatever it was, it didn't so much as flinch when the bullet ricocheted off its skin. A long, thin arm crashed against the door, knocking the doctor backwards into his work table. He steadied himself and climbed back to his feet, taking in the damage done to the door. It was crumpled in on itself, nearly ripped off the hinges, and whatever had plowed into it was already gone. From the sounds of chaos in the distance, it had disappeared around the corner, with the guards following it. He inspected the ruins of the door to his containment cell. It was useless now, hanging loose and open. Well, that was an invitation he was hardly about to decline. He grabbed his trusty bag, tossed his scalpel back inside, and set off to see what all the commotion was. It was easy enough to follow the trail of blood, stark and vivid red against the white tile floor, and the sound of gunfire, human screams, and that loud, long, painful wail he had heard before. He walked at a leisurely pace, taking his time, until the sound suddenly stopped. He rounded the corner and found a mound of bodies, guards and scientists, beaten and bloodied, almost beyond recognition. It was quiet here, save for one sound, the sound of weeping. There in the corner, huddled over with its face to the wall, was a pale, thin figure, its shoulders heaving with the force of its sobs. This poor soul was clearly in great distress. It was a peculiar sight, hairless and white, distended arms wrapped around itself as it cried. Excuse me, the doctor cried out to the pitiful creature. Are you all right? Do you need assistance? It didn't answer. It just continued to cry. Had something so despondent been responsible for this destruction? The dozens of corpses, the smashed in walls, the crumbled doors and shattered windows. It seemed impossible. Sure, it was large and looked strong, but he had never seen a monster cry before. This couldn't be a dangerous creature, not when it was so sad. He would help it, but first, he would attend to some of these bodies. He sat his bag on the ground and pulled out several vials of liquid, a set of syringes, and a variety of other surgical tools he might need. Now, after such a long hiatus, he could resume his work in a meaningful way. He couldn't be certain how long he worked reviving these poor souls and reconstructing their bodies as the pale creature wept in the corner. The sobbing faded into the background for a while, becoming a kind of white noise as he removed a liver here, placed it in a chest cavity there, poked and prodded, injected and extracted, testing out new methods alongside tried and true cures. One by one, the milky eyes fluttered open, rigor mortis stiff joints creaked into motion, sallow faces looking at his with the vacant gratitude he saw in so many patients over the years. He didn't need to thank him with their words. The work was its own reward. He expected more guards to arrive, to attempt to contain the situation, but none came, even as the alarm blared overhead. As for the morose creature, he didn't seem to notice his presence at all, not even when he had brought all of the intact corpses back to life. The patient shuffled around the room aimlessly, waiting for orders of some kind. 
The doctor tapped one on the shoulder and handed the reborn man a vial of thick black medicine. Give this to the poor fellow in the corner, please. It wasn't much, but it should calm him. Provide some relief from his suffering. The corpse nodded, mouth hanging loose and open, an eyeball dangling unseen from the socket. He shuffled over to the strange creature and held out the vial to it. It turned, lifting its head, and as it locked eyes with the cured patient, something shifted in its face. Its mouth opened wide, impossibly wide, and it shrieked, that same terrible sound as before. Tears streamed from its colorless eyes, its arms shaking with unbridled rage as its jaws locked around the patient's head. Like a boa constrictor, in one fluid motion it swallowed the revived man whole while the doctor watched in shock. He had been wrong. This was not an innocent creature caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. This creature, whatever it was, was deeply sick. He had never seen such an advanced, aggressive case of the pestilence. He'd heard rumors, of course, but never encountered it firsthand. As a doctor, he had sworn to do no harm, but in a drastic situation, drastic measures have to be taken. It was well known by himself and the doctors at this foundation that he could cause any and all biological functions in an organism to cease with a single touch. And so he approached the creature, arm outstretched, ready to administer that necessary touch to protect the rest of his patients. As he approached, the creature turned to him, its eyes wide and blank, an endless stream of tears pouring from them, spilling onto the floor. It shrieked again, mouth stretching wide enough to engulf his entire head, and ran toward him at a breakneck speed. I am so sorry you are not well, the doctor said simply, as his hand pressed to the creature's chest. As soon as the tough hide of the doctor's hand, which the uninformed might mistake for gloves, made contact with the unpigmented skin of the beast, its eyes closed, its muscles went slack, and it collapsed to the ground with a mighty thud. The doctor paced around the fallen creature, taking in the sight. Then something strange caught his eye. The creature's chest still rose and fell. Was it his imagination? He checked its pulse and thought it was slow and faint. And though it was slow and faint, it was very much present. The creature was still alive. It had merely been rendered unconscious by his touch rather than completely deceased. Curious. Very curious indeed he muttered. Perhaps there were comorbidities present, other infections aside from the pestilence, which rendered the creature unnaturally strong, resilient to the usual courses of treatment. What would cause these abilities, this intense aggression? It seemed to be brought on whenever someone looked at the entity's face. If only he studied psychology more, the science of the mind and its inner workings. Since he had no experience with therapy, nor was he certain this creature could communicate using language at all, there was only one way to find out more about how this creature's brain worked. He would have to take it apart and see for himself. It was slow work, getting the massive creature back to the doctor's containment cell. He required the help of his cured patients, who grasped it by its massive limbs and dragged the limp body through the halls. Once back in a familiar environment, his work table ready and waiting, the doctor instructed his assistants to place the new patient on the table. It was a bit small, unable to accommodate the creature's distended limbs, but if he attempted to use an official foundation laboratory, he risked discovery and subsequent interruption. So it would have to suffice. First, he set up an IV stand, filled with a vivid green liquid. It was easy to find a vein. The creature's skin was nearly translucent. Now that he could be certain the creature would not wake during surgery, he could make the first incision. Scalpel. He held out a hand and his favorite surgical blade was placed in it by one of the helpful patients. Thank you. He slid the scalpel along the hairline of the creature, or where the hairline would be if it weren't completely bald. Once the scalp was removed, he set it aside for later, when it could be reattached. Bonsa, please. He held out his hand again, and again his assistant gave him the proper tool. This, however, was when things got strange. The doctor had always been a deft hand at cutting. He'd once even received tutelage from the great Robert Liston, but no matter how hard he tried to saw, it never left a scratch on the creature's skeleton. Naturally, this was somewhat frustrating. He wanted to study the creature's brain tissue, to get a sense for what was going up there neurologically. And he couldn't do that if it was impossible to saw off the creature's cranial cap. 
He blunted two of his favorite saws while trying. Thankfully, there was still a solution to access the beast's gray matter, a little trick he'd learned while studying the funerary practices of the ancient Egyptians. He produced a long, curved hook from his bag and inserted it up the creature's nasal passage. With some fine maneuvering, he eventually managed to remove the brain. It was such a terrible shame that he needed to do it piece by piece via the nasal passage, but one makes do. All that was left was to sew the skin of the creature's head back into place. It was mid-stitch when a voice interrupted his careful work, nearly making him drop the needle. Hey, what are you doing? He looked up to find a guard, aiming a gun at his face. Excuse me, I am in surgery at the moment. Please do not interrupt. He admonished the guard, but the man did not listen or lower his weapon. In fact, he shouted something into the radio, code words the doctor didn't recognize. Then he fired a bullet into the skull of the patient standing at his side. How dare you? The doctor cried, readying himself to confront the guard, but it was too late. Dozens of other guards were swarming the room and neutralizing his assistants. Some in hazmat suits grabbed his arms and pulled him away from the creature on the operating table, no matter how hard he fought or how loudly he protested. Then something incredible happened, something wonderful. The creature opened its eyes and sat up. It looked directly at the guard closest to it, and the two saw one another's faces. The guard tensed, preparing for the worst, but nothing came. The creature simply stared, placid and quiet. No screaming, no tearing at flesh, no mouth opening wider and wider to swallow the man whole. I did it, the doctor shouted, overcome with elation. I've cured you. Now begins the rest of your happy life. He watched as the guards led the shockingly calm creature away back to its containment cell. The doctor's door was repaired, and he was returned to his state of captivity, but he never forgot the patient he helped that day, and how marvelous it felt to do such a good deed. Meanwhile, SCP-096's brain regrew within the hour and caused another massive containment breach, murdering a variety of researchers and guards. But the staff agreed not to tell SCP-049 about any of this. Better to just let him have this one. He really seemed like he needed a win. The day-to-day -day routine of Dr. Gears consisted of a few constants. Piping hot cups of black, unsweetened coffee, plain dry wheat toast, the soothing sounds of his favorite white noise machine, and the endless carousel of experiments with SCP-914. Not that he was complaining. He was perfectly content to spend his time supervising one of the few anomalies he crossed paths with on a regular basis that was unlikely to kill or maim him in any way. Not that the clockworks hadn't produced its fair share of unpredictable results over the years of extensive testing, it had definitely offered up more than a few surprises. And anyone who knew Dr. Gears knew that he was not especially fond of surprises. Dr. Bright had attempted to throw a surprise birthday party for the man once, but when he turned on the lights and fired the confetti cannon, all Dr. Gears did in response was give a deep sigh and say, Really, Jack, you're making a spectacle of yourself. Still, he had resigned himself long ago to the fact that supervising the experiments with SCP-914 meant witnessing some truly unpredictable outcomes. How could he forget the time researcher Blas tested an incandescent light bulb on the setting very fine, and the machine spat out an anthropomorphic humanoid light bulb that spoke in German-accented English and claimed to be Thomas Edison himself? This was, of course, impossible as historical records surely would have indicated if Thomas Edison was a walking, talking light bulb rather than a human man. The imposter was eventually incinerated after its presence became too irritating to ignore. And then there was the time researcher Thompson filled out a Dungeons & Dragons character sheet and placed it into the machine on the setting very fine. The output produced was a sheet of paper promoting the previously non-existent tabletop role-playing game Fear in the Foundation. Whenever a person read the paper, they would suddenly find themselves in an out-of-body experience where they were inside the game's world, which contained several characters related to the SCP Foundation, as well as items and locations based on real-world counterparts. A subject in this state would only snap back to reality after winning or dying in the game. Researcher Jacobson rolled a 1 on stealth and saw SCP-096's face in the game and was later found dead in the anomalous item storage wing. There was no shortage of Foundation staff trying to use the machine for personal gain, too. Dr. Naismith placed his credit card inside on the setting very fine, 
using it to produce a card covered in unidentified corporate insignias and reading, Rank Aleph Infinite Money Privileges. When Dr. Coltrane issued a written warning, Dr. Naismith took that warning and then placed it into the machine on the same setting, producing a piece of official documentation from the O5 Council in support of his infinite money privileges. Junior researcher Summers attempted to use SCP-914 in a misguided attempt at self-improvement, placing not an object, but herself in the intake booth before running the machine on the setting very fine. It cleared her skin, lengthened her hair, and improved her figure. This was, of course, in violation of several employee guidelines, and she was promptly dismissed after emerging from SCP-914. Dr. Veritas left a note in the experiment log following this incident, reading, By the time we realized what she was actually doing, it was too late to stop her. Needless to say, she's since been terminated, and I hope I don't need to tell you all not to do that again. And with that, the guideline was clear. No one was permitted to use SCP-914 for personal gain, or to change anything about themselves. Potential complications were too risky, not to mention the conflicts of interest that would be introduced into what should be an impartial research process. As Scientific Objectivity's biggest fan, Dr. Gears couldn't agree more. So as he settled in for the day's round of tests, he intended to keep a watchful eye on things and ensure that no funny business would take place. He didn't have much reason for concern, as his colleague Dr. Bonita prepped her research materials. She was working with two items, a small replica of Michelangelo's sculpture of David and a sealed envelope containing something that was to be handled with extreme caution, a photograph of SCP-096's face. She planned to place the items inside on the very fine setting, in an attempt to see what result might be produced from combining an ideal of traditional beauty standards with the image of a creature that felt such profound shame and distress as its own appearance that it would destroy anyone who looked at its face. Like any good scientist, Dr. Bonita wanted to remove any unnecessary variables from her experiment. So as she placed her items inside the intake booth, she slowly, delicately unsealed the envelope. She wanted to put the picture inside by itself, without the extra element of the envelope potentially complicating things. Unfortunately, like Marie Curie slowly, unintentionally poisoning herself with her own research materials, she didn't truly understand the danger of what she held in her hands. Just as she was setting the photograph down, her eyes flickered to the image. Before she could stop herself, before she could even look away or squeeze her eyes shut, she caught a glimpse of the one thing she should never look at, SCP-096's face. She gasped and slammed the photograph down, but she knew it was too late. The sound of an inhuman shriek coming from across the facility signaled that she was right. It was coming for her, and nothing in the world could stop it. In a containment cell on the other side of the facility, Foundation staff were horrified as they heard the telltale scream of an enraged SCP-096. The pale, thin creature, once huddled in the corner silently, had stretched to its full height of 2.38 meters and was screaming, sobbing, wailing, and gibberish, and beginning to tear its way out of its chamber. Guards tried their best to subdue the entity, firing their weapons at it, but the bullets did nothing to damage the creature's pale flesh or stop its movements. It ripped through the steel cube that contained it, and knocked the guards out of its way with one swipe of its unnaturally long arms, sending them careening into a nearby wall. Fortunately for them, SCP-096 only knocked them unconscious. It didn't stop to harm them further, as it had a more important goal in mind. Find the person who had seen its face and destroy them. As the alarm blared, signifying a high threat level containment breach, SCP-096 loped down the hall toward Dr. Bonita in SCP-914's room. Dr. Gears had not spotted Dr. Bonita's grave mistake and had no idea what had triggered the alarm he was hearing. He stepped away from the observation window, turning his attention to the crisis that was clearly happening somewhere else in the facility. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was panicking. She saw her life flash before her eyes, the certainty of impending doom that was coming for her and coming fast all because of one brief error in judgment. What could she do? There was nowhere to hide, no way she could run away fast enough, unless if she managed to lure 096 into the intake booth and 
and start the machine while the creature was inside, maybe it would transform into something less intent on tearing her limb from limb. It was a risky move, and one that could jeopardize her position at the Foundation, but she couldn't very well keep her job if she was dead, so it seemed like it just might be worth a shot. A primal roar of agony and fury interrupted her thoughts, and she knew that SCP-096 was moments away from breaking down the door and getting its hands on her. She would have to move fast. With a screeching grind of metal on metal, SCP-096 wrenched the door off its hinges and barreled into the room in its search for the person who had seen its face. It ran toward the silhouette of Dr. Bonita standing just at the entrance to the intake booth. She tucked and rolled out of the way just as the monster entered the booth. The door automatically slid shut behind it, and as SCP-096 rattled the door and tried to free itself, she turned the knob to very fine with every ounce of strength and speed she had. There was a ding of a small bell and the machine whirred to life as the objects inside were refined. Dr. Bonita had no idea what would be waiting for her in the output booth, but she could only hope that her last-ditch effort had managed to save her life. In the fog of panic, she briefly felt an itch of scientific curiosity, too. What would become of a being like SCP-096 in a machine as strange and wonderful as SCP-914? What would the addition of the statue do to it? As the door to the outtake booth slid open, steam poured out. It appeared her questions would soon be answered. Cautiously, in spite of herself, Dr. Bonita called out, Hello? No one answered, but she heard the sound of footsteps, slow and careful, as a figure emerged from the mist. She covered her mouth in shock, her eyes wide. Dear God, she whispered in awe. Standing in front of her with pale, smooth skin and the same imposing stature was the most beautiful man she had ever seen. Wide, dark eyes shone under thick, sculpted eyebrows. Under the eyes, an aquiline nose, full, pouty lips, a strong, sharp jawline. His head was topped with a tangle of lustrous, dark curls. It was the kind of hair she had only seen flowing in the wind on the covers of the romance novels she wanted desperately to buy but was too embarrassed to be seen purchasing. His physique was, well, statuesque, like the build of the very Michelangelo sculpture she had placed into the machine just moments ago. There was no other way to say it. He was handsome, despite still being a little lanky and nine feet tall. He peered at her curiously, towering over her in a way that had been terrifying in his former shape, but now made her heart skip a beat in an entirely different way. Hi, was all she could think to say. Was she blushing? She shook her head, snapping herself out of it. She was a scientist, damn it, not some giddy schoolgirl passing notes in class. This was an incredible achievement, something she would need to study thoroughly, and she very much wanted to study him thoroughly. Nope, no time for that. She needed to write up a report to inform her superiors to try her best not to lose her job over this. She had to remain professional. Hi. The man that had once been, or perhaps still was, SCP-096 spoke. Oh, you, you can talk. Dr. Bonita laughed in surprise. The man's brow furrowed. His newfound ability to speak was a surprise to him too, it seemed. Yes, I can. What happened to me? He yeah, asked, stumbling over his words slightly, getting used to the feeling of them. You ran into the machine. She gestured to SCP-914. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, but you're very different now. He nodded. I feel different. I feel calm. He sighed, the relief plain on his face before a shadow of sadness fell over him. I don't think I have to hurt anymore. I, I'm sorry for what I did before. Dr. Bonita did not know what to say. How do you respond when something you've been studying from afar, been horrified and fascinated by an equal measure, looks at you with a new, beautiful face and apologizes for all the harm it caused? This whole experience was so surreal that she might think she was dreaming if she didn't work at a place that was one long waking dream, or nightmare, depending on the day. Uh, Dr. Bonita, there's been a containment breach. Are you all right? Dr. Gears had returned to the room, taking in the sight of the destruction left in 096's way. I'm fine, she called to him, and he followed her voice into the room, then stopped at the sight of the transformed anomaly. Hmm. I don't have time for whatever this is. I trust you'll handle it. Dr. Gears took a long sip of his coffee, and taking Bonita's shock silence as confirmation, 
had a leisurely stroll back to his office. A few moments later, the guards responsible for containing SCP-096 arrived on the scene, expecting to see carnage and find a docile SCP-096 crouched over a lifeless body, but instead, they found the same truly bizarre sight that Dr. Gears had shrugged off, and Dr. Bonita was still doing her best to process. They entered the room with their weapons drawn, but quickly lowered them, scratching their heads in confusion instead before radioing their superiors and asking for further instructions. Responses from various Foundation staff who caught a glimpse of SCP-096's bold new look included, Oh, would you look at that? Who's that guy? He's what? And in the words of Dr. Jack Bright, Oh no, he's hot! <laughs> Dr. Bright also proposed making the new SCP-096 a TikTok account and YouTube channel, seeking modeling representation for him, or selling a novelty calendar filled with pictures of 096 in various costumes. These would be, in his words, quote, excellent ways to increase revenue for the Foundation. So, really, you're the weird ones now for thinking my ideas are weird. Dr. Bright was asked to leave SCP-096 alone and stop trying to take his headshot. In the days that followed the incident with SCP-914, the SCP Foundation was at a loss about what to do with this new, seemingly harmless version of SCP-096. Dozens of D-Class were brought in to look at his face and see if the entity would still enter one of his rage states after a few days of getting used to his new form, but he never did. No screaming, no swallowing people whole, nothing more than a polite, if somewhat shy greeting and a courteous, how are you doing today? The D-Classes were relieved, but confused about being pulled from their cells just to stare at some random handsome man. Dr. Clef suggested dissecting SCP-096 to see what his new body looked like on the inside. This request was denied. Several interviews were conducted to evaluate SCP-096's mental and emotional state. Now that the anomaly was capable of coherent speech, it was much simpler to evaluate the potential threat level he might pose. Every researcher who spoke with him came to the same conclusion. Gone was the danger of the old SCP-096. He had not just become beautiful in a classical, superficial sense, but he had become beautiful on the inside as well. Interviewers reported a warm, friendly demeanor, a talent for engaging in conversation once he was made to feel comfortable, and a sincere interest in the thoughts, opinions, and feelings of those he spoke with. There was only one thing left to do, to make sure that SCP-096 had really changed from something deadly to something almost resembling an ordinary person. A photograph of SCP-096's face, of its original face, was removed from a secure vault by a D-Class. Then, the D-Class was sent into a room with SCP-096 and instructed to place the photograph on the table. SCP-096 looked down at what had once been his face, and his eyes filled with tears. A soft, broken sob left his lips, and he wrapped his arms around himself, hunching over as if in physical pain. Outside the room, guards prepared to handle things if 096 began to attack. Instead, he wiped his tears, took a deep, shuddering breath, and looked at the D-Class with a somber expression. He picked up the photograph on the table and tore it in half, as he finally summoned the strength to speak. Please, get rid of these. That is not who I am anymore. At Dr. Bonita's strong insistence, backed up by the conclusions of the research staff who interviewed SCP-096, a re-evaluation of the entity's containment measure was ordered. It seemed cruel and unnecessary waste of resources to keep 096 trapped in a steel cube in its current form. He would be moved to a standard humanoid containment cell and treated as well as other safe class anomalies provided with books, films, food, and drink upon request, and, of course, other comforts. Of course, the O5 Council insisted on evaluating the entity before any of these changes could be approved. Dressed in a specially tailored suit provided by Dr. Bonita, SCP-096 appeared before the Council to present his case. I know that I might not have the best record at the Foundation. I've done a lot of damage over the years, though, let's be honest, you all aren't exactly innocent either. Sorry, that was an attempt at a joke. I'm still very new to talking. All I can say is please consider giving me another chance to make a real life here, to make this place my home. Thank you for your time. 
What SCP-096 didn't know is that the O5 Council was so flabbergasted by the sight of his new face that they didn't retain a single word he said. They had all given their official approval before he even finished his short presentation. Before long, SCP-096 was moved out of his steel cube and into a new containment chamber that resembled a mid-range studio apartment, complete with a bed, a kitchenette, a television, and a table and chairs. He was provided access to all major streaming platforms, as well as a large stack of books to help him develop his grasp of culture and language after so very long being isolated from human society. Though he wasn't exactly human, he was determined to act like it. Word quickly spread around the Foundation site, and humans and anomalies alike flocked to SCP-096's new home to visit him and see the miraculous transformation for themselves. SCP-999 was the first to come and see the new and improved 096, chirping excitedly as it oozed into his room. He pet the slime gently, his face breaking into a warm smile as its euphoric effect washed over him. The slime became so excited at meeting this new friend, someone it had known as a source of sadness and hurt for so long, that it tackled him to the ground and tickled him for several minutes, 096 laughing uproariously all the while. SCP-343 stopped by to give 096 his blessing and wish him well in this new chapter of life. A few days later, SCP-507 popped back into the site and wanted to see the changes for himself. He was thoroughly impressed, though privately confessed to missing 096's more monstrous form, which reminded him of some of his favorite cryptids. There was one anomaly that was not thrilled with the appearance of SCP-096, however. SCP-056 was furious upon hearing about the new beautiful man that everyone just couldn't shut up about. It demanded a chance to speak to SCP-096 and to tell him that this place isn't big enough for the both of us. I'm the fairest one of all, you sniveling little worm. But the request was denied. SCP-056 sulked about it for several weeks. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was still intent on getting to know SCP-096 better. During previous testing with SCP-978 The Desire Camera, a photo taken of SCP-096 revealed that his greatest desire was to disappear. Curious about the results would be now, Dr. Bonita received permission to take another picture of SCP-096. She snapped the photo while 096 was sitting in a chair in his new containment chamber, looking directly at the camera. When the photo developed, the result was simple. Everything in the picture was exactly the same with one exception. Dr. Bonita was pictured sitting next to 096, her hand clasped in his. Both were smiling soft, contented smiles. When she showed him the photograph, he smiled at her and shook his head. It really is an amazing camera. She flushed. Doctor, before you go, could I ask your name? Dr. Bonita smiled and nodded. It's Isabel. What should I call you? SCP-096 paused thoughtfully for a moment. He was giving himself a name for the very first time, allowing himself an identity other than a strange, hollow, pale thing that existed to cry and suffer and hurt. Finally, he answered her. Call me David. A very strange anomaly sits in a humanoid containment cell in the minimum security wing of Site-17. He walks, talks, and looks like a man, but everything else is convoluted in a question mark. This is SCP-343, who, like his namesake, God, is likely to cause arguments whenever he's brought up. Is he the creator of all that exists, the basis for the Abrahamic faiths, or is he a pretender? a reality warper with immense power and predilection towards delusion, a courtesian of the house of Maladrog, Matthew, Methuselah, Yahweh, who knows? Really, it depends on who you ask, and which stories you choose to believe, and few people enjoy a good story more than SCP-343 himself. If one day you take the time to visit him in his room and ask him to reveal a page in the long book of his personal history, he might be kind enough to tell you a story. A story like this, of an encounter with something monstrous that few others could hope to survive meeting face to face. Rewind a few thousand years. Nobody knows how many, exactly. God, as he chooses to dub himself, walked across the cracked ground on worn sandals. It'd been some time since he'd seen an animal around here, and even longer since he'd seen a human being. Not that this bothered him. He'd never been bothered by his own company on a long walk like this. Of course, he could have sped up time or teleported, but where was the fun in that? He was a tourist in the world of sensation, of experience, 
of flesh, bone, dirt, blood, and sand. After all, where's the fun in creating a whole universe if you can't drop in now and then to visit and do as the Romans do? Not that the Romans would be around for another few thousand years. Even Atlas must occasionally shift the weight of the globe from his shoulders for a jaunt around the cosmic neighborhood and whatever passes for fresh air in the vacuum. God whistled a tune to himself. It was a craggy, mountainous region he'd found himself in. The distant peaks had frosted caps, a breathtaking place where many truly had their breaths taken away. How humans will so happily risk their lives to do something extraordinary. It never ceased to amaze him. His stomach rumbled. Oh, how he enjoyed that sensation. One of the funny little quirks of this human form that he weaved for himself. It was no reason to be concerned. If memory served, from his last trip through the area a few decades before, there was a friendly village not far from here. They had always accepted him as a genial stranger, having no knowledge of his true power. God had always believed that a person's goodness is defined by how they treat those from whom they had nothing to gain. So it caused him great concern as he approached the village and saw great plumes of smoke rising into the sky. He was so shocked by this that he could decide to break his rule about walking as a man in case there was still some way he could help. With a snap of his fingers, he disappeared and reappeared in the center of the village's town square. Total devastation. Huts and houses had been torn asunder. Broken weapons lay on the ground. Some places were on fire. Others smeared with streaks of blood, like some terrible battle had occurred here. But something was wrong. No bodies, not one, from defender or assailant. How could a thriving village be so thoroughly destroyed and not leave a single corpse? It was an act so bizarre and depraved that it left even God puzzling. That was another downside of his human form. Here on Earth, he didn't have access to true omniscience. How could a mere human mind, bound by the constraints of linear time, ever truly comprehend the total of existence? Even attempting to do that here would melt the brain of his human body in its skull and leave it dribbling out of his nose and ears. Instead, he chose to walk around the ruins of the village and investigate firsthand. Arrows and broken spears and swords littered the ground. Some buildings were demolished but there were no tracks or stray projectiles that could suggest the presence of siege weapons. No, these buildings looked like they were ripped apart. Some even still had claw marks. What terrible beast could have set upon this town and done this? Then he heard a voice, quiet and pleading beneath some nearby rubble. A survivor, he rushed over to the pile and evaporated it with a thought. Underneath a feeble old man, covered in stone dust, was quivering. God helped him up and guided him into one of the few remaining huts still standing in the village. They both took seats. God held up two hands, cradling empty space. Two cups suddenly occupied that space, both filled with warm, healing tea. He passed the old man one of the cups while sipping from his own. He asked the old man if he'd seen what had happened. The old man told him no, he hadn't seen anything in decades. He'd been rendered blind in his youth. Little did either of them know that very blindness was the only reason he was the sole survivor of the massacre. The blind man told God that one of the village's scouts had gone up into the mountain with a small hunting party. The group was gone for days until one of the members, the youngest among them, returned weeping, frostbitten, and covered in blood. He said that his friends had been killed by a beast in the mountains, something that almost looked like a man but terribly wrong, and its face, its awful, awful face. He would never forget it. He was just lucky to escape with his life when the others were torn apart. But when the young man returned, he'd brought the shadow of death with him. It was a curse that doomed the entire village, men, women, and children, to a terrible fate. And that fate was upon them a mere hour after the survivor had returned. Of course, there were gaps in the blind man's understanding, given he was lacking one of his major senses, but the sounds he could describe with perfect clarity. It was faint and distant at first, that awful wail and the galloping, hands and feet thundering against the ground faster than any horse could move, getting closer and closer. Another villager saw it approaching and screamed. Then it was upon them. The villagers screamed, but it screamed louder. 
always wailing and shrieking and sobbing like a monster crawling straight up from hell. People tried to fight it by the sounds of it. The blind man with teary blank eyes recalled the sounds of arrows knocking and swords clashing against something. But even their greatest warriors had screamed and died. Those who saw it and tried to flee and hide were slaughtered all the same. Soon enough, there were only two sounds left in the village. The monster and the blind man, both weeping. He didn't understand why it never took him. It wasn't fair. It took everything else. To leave him here alive when everyone and everything he'd ever known was destroyed was a greater punishment than even death. After killing all of these innocents, the monster had simply wandered off to the mountains again, the sound of its quiet sobs getting smaller and smaller until it was gone altogether. God comforted the blind man as he wept for the loss of all his loved ones. He told the blind man that he would venture up to the mountains himself and confront the creature on its own territory, and at the very least, find out why it had done this terrible thing. But first, he must relocate the blind man to a safer place. He placed a hand on the blind man's shoulder and he vanished. He would appear in another friendly village miles away. God sent a silent message into the minds of every villager. Take good care of this man. He has undergone horrors you can't even imagine. Your kindness will be rewarded later. For that, you have my promise. God sighed and turned his tired eyes to the distant mountains. A monster lurked up there, perhaps one of his own creations, or maybe a corruption of one of his creations. Either way, whatever existed without his knowledge existed without his consent and he intended to know of the beast in the mountains. Though given what he'd seen already, he didn't expect to receive a warm welcome from this murderous demon. Miles away up in the mountains, the creature licked the blood from its cracked lips. It looked like it might have once been a human being or something that aspired to humanity or mocked it with its very existence. It was a huge, gangling beast, Skin alablaster, eyes empty and soulless, dribbling rivulets of burning tears down a hideous, gaunt face. It crawled into the frozen mouth of a cave with great icicle fangs, wheezing and weeping. All it ever wanted was to be alone. Why did they have to keep interfering? Didn't they know what happened? All the terrible things they made it do. The creature curled its long, gangly body into the fetal position scratching great ruts into the sides of its bald cranium with long, sharp fingers. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. And then there was a brilliant flash just a few feet away. The monster was surprised. It turned to see a figure silhouetted in the mouth of the cave. He wore sandals and thin robes. His eyes glowed with a kind of power that the monster didn't recognize. This stranger stared at the monster without an ounce of fear in his heart. He stared right into its eyes, unwavering. No, 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 no! He could feel it again, the rage bubbling up deep down. A cauldron of seething anger, it hated the feeling like being lowered into a vat of molten metal. Unspeakable fire and pain coursing through every vessel. It began to weep and scream while the stranger in the cave mouth just watched, not moving a muscle. Do you know who I am? The stranger asked with a deep voice that betrayed almost infinite power, knowledge, and wisdom. But it wouldn't change the outcome here. The monster bounded at him at speeds that wouldn't be seen again until jet planes and bullet trains are invented millennia into the future. Its jaws were hanging impossibly wide, fangs born, its arms extended and deadly claws ready to strike. But before those terrible hands could close around the stranger, he vanished. The monster stumbled and rolled across the snow, confused. What trickery was being used here? I'll take that as a no, said the voice from behind him. You ought to show your father some respect. More respect than you gave to those poor people down in the village, at least. Seething, the creature turned and saw the stranger standing back in the darkness of the cave, staring at him. But the beast didn't have the capacity for awe or holy terror. Only violence. Boundless, limitless, unstoppable violence. It darted towards the stranger again, trying to strike him. Somehow it was like fighting in an empty robe. Not a single one of its deadly strikes seemed to hit the stranger. 
The stranger leaped backwards, putting some space between himself and the monster, but still not breaking a sweat. He breathed in deeply, then exhaled. The breath came out like a mighty typhoon, shocking even the monster with its sudden force. It was blown backwards a leaf in the wind, until its long claws dug into the ground and anchored it in place. The stranger gave a wry smile at this, impressed. My, my, you're certainly a tenacious one, aren't you? He said. Perhaps we can talk for a little while instead of fighting. I want to know why you killed all those people. No answer. The beast roared, its mighty limbs pounding into the ground as it closed the gap between itself and the stranger in fractions of a second. It would kill him, rend him, destroy him just like all the others. He'd left it no choice. Suddenly the ground below it seemed to give way. The creature was confused. It looked down to see that the ancient stone below had somehow taken on the properties of a liquid, and it was sinking. The beast panicked and it began to thrash. It was a strong swimmer, but it didn't expect to need to swim here. The shock was too much, and soon the ground submerged it entirely, muffling its terrible roars and shrieks. And just like that, the ground was solid again, trapping the beast inside. The stranger stepped forward and looked at the ground. A much needed time out, he said. You do yourself no good struggling like this. Despite its terrible capacity for evil, God couldn't help but admire the beast, at least on the level of construction. It was so pared down, so unburdened, a killer to the core but seemingly unkillable. Had he made this creature? Billions of species and the species those in turn had created through billions of years of breeding and evolution, and somewhere along the line, this thing happened. It was easy even for the universe's creator to lose track of some of the tinier variables. And in the grand scheme of things, even this monster was still a tiny variable. But right here, right now, it was still one hell of a problem. The ground rumbled below God. Cracks formed. The mountain peak shook. God raised an eyebrow, genuinely impressed, as the monster ripped free of its stone prison and re-entered the fray. It roared and screamed still its blank eyes fixed on him, its skeletal body throbbed and heaved with power. Unlike any other creature in nature, it was almost like the longer their conflict went on, the more energized the beast became. God sighed. All those poor villagers. They never stood a chance against this monster. It lunged for him, even faster and stronger than before. He teleported out of the way in the nick of time, and the beast's claws cleaved through a nearby cave wall, effortless. God materialized nearby, but he didn't have time to speak. The beast lunged again and again and again. Every time he reappeared, the beast went for him with impossible speed. Deciding to widen the playing field, God teleported to the top of the mountain. The creature, somehow sensing his presence, vaulted upwards and tunneled through the roof of the cave, bursting out of the ground in front of God, who was floating just slightly off the ground. It would be wise of you to stop. God carefully intoned. All this time, you know, I've been going easy on you. You don't want to find out what the wrath of God looks like. Storm clouds were gathering above. Mighty thunder roared across the sky. The beast was undeterred. It roared and galloped towards God. And God, in turn, called down a response. A volley of lightning the likes of which the world has never seen before or since struck down on the charging monster. The sudden white flash could sting the eyes from miles away. The monster shrieked from the blast, feeling its flesh lift off its bones and atomize in the sheer heat of the electricity around it. It could smell itself cooking. The lightning blast only lasted for a few seconds, but for the beast, it felt like eternity. When the onslaught stopped, the air was still heavy with electrical potential. God stared down at the black scorch mark on the side of the mountain where the creature had been standing. All the snow within a mile had been evaporated by the blast. It was a raw display of the power of nature that would make even Zeus tremble in his sandals. And yet, there was still movement. Something started to get up from the burnt patch where nothing should be left alive. A blackened skeleton, rising shakily from the ash but still very much alive. As it started to rise, new flesh began growing over its bones little by little. Even God was astonished by the sight of it. 
He'd never seen a creature cling so ardently to life in spite of having truly unsurmountable power amassed against it. It was up against God, and still, it fought. The monster tottered on its freakishly long limbs, still disoriented, unusually staggered for a creature driven by such single-minded violent purpose. When enough of its face grew back to do so, it began to weep and sob again, tears streaking down its terrible face. Looking at this creature after all of this, God couldn't help but feel a new emotion, pity. He lowered himself to the ground and approached the creature, like none had ever done before. He gathered it up into his arms and he held it, feeling its heaving, wretched sobs against him. The beast was in so much pain, he could feel it radiating from within. Speak, my son. God said in a soft, fatherly voice. And for the first and only time, the monster spoke. Can can see? <coughs> Make me a people. Known what a people can look. Can look. Please. That was all it managed to choke out before devolving back into unintelligible babble. But it was enough. Enough for God to understand its pain. He did not know if it would be right to change the monster's nature. Is it ever right to truly change anyone's nature? But it was within his almost limitless power to grant it one reprieve from pain. He settled the beast in the snow below him. It was quiet and still. And God said unto the beast, Rest now, child. Rest for thousands of years if you must. I hope only that when you eventually awaken, you feel differently. And so another story from the catalog of SCP-343. Of course, it leaves us with certain questions, mm. chief among them being, is it true? Did 343 and 096 have this chance encounter long ago? Or is this just another tall tale from an anomaly who fancies himself a deity? We have our truth and you have yours. Let us know what you believe down below in the comments. Dr. Dan anxiously paced in his cell. It was the only way he'd been able to occupy himself for the past six months, save for pouring through files and, when he was lucky, being able to oversee another failed termination attempt. He only stopped pacing when, for a brief and horrible moment, he realized that Monster was probably doing the exact same thing in its big metal cube at this very moment. That horrible creature that he'd thrown away his life for a futile shot at killing. Perhaps the whole thing had been a fool's errand. After all, he was formerly a researcher under the employ of the SCP Foundation. Secure. Contain. Protect. They had truly sadistic beasts like SCP-106, the nightmarish old man, and SCP-352 Baba Yaga in containment cells, and there was no plans to terminate either of them. They weren't the Global Occult Coalition for 343's sake. Why did Dr. Dan even want to terminate SCP-096 in the first place? He tried to explain it to them again and again, but his pleas had fallen on deaf ears. In his mind, the impetus for destroying the Shy Guy was terrifyingly clear. It was a monster that killed anyone or anything that looked at its face, even a photograph of it, even a tiny collection of pixels. When its rage state was induced, it seemed that nothing would stop it. It would have an intuitive psychic link to its victim, charge at them at breakneck speed, and only find its zen again once all of them were dead. And if a picture of SCP-096 was leaked onto the internet, it would cause a chain reaction that triggered an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. There were plenty of creatures and entities that the Foundation knew about that could theoretically bring about the apocalypse, but to him, 096 was the most realistic. It preyed upon the inherent curiosity and thirst for knowledge seated in every human heart. The same drive to simply know that led to the creation of the SCP Foundation would be humanity's doom in the face of an SCP-096 outbreak. And if such a thing happened, the Foundation would need to break the masquerade of secrecy to have any hope of saving humanity. In his many feverish nightmares, Dr. Dan had seen it all so clearly. The first photographs of SCP-096's face would be leaked online. Perhaps a few hundred people across the globe would look, 
in disparate enough locations that it would be almost impossible for the Foundation to detect and save all of them, as SCP-096 went on its bloody rampage. Of course, as the image proliferated, as images on the internet often do, the purview of 096's violence would only grow. People across the nation would start to take notice, and soon after that, across the world. Mysterious creature causing mass casualties would be the headline on every news desk, because why would anybody want to talk about anything else? Perhaps some foolish reporters would take video footage of the creature. Everyone has a phone these days with high-definition cameras, pictures would be taken and posted. More and more of it would flood the internet. Too many simultaneous moles for even the SCP Foundation to whack. The news would spread. Panic and hysteria would spread. People wouldn't even know what's triggering all this horror if the Foundation didn't go public and tell them that it was the pictures that was killing everyone. And by then, wouldn't it already be too late? The antidote to fear is knowledge. It's why when anything goes wrong, we're refreshing timelines and feeds and news websites for any kind of information. And if you were told an unstoppable monster was killing scores of people and might be coming to a neighborhood near you sometime soon, wouldn't you want a good look at it? Wouldn't you want to know your enemy? Having no idea that the mere act of knowing was what sealed your horrible fate. By Dr. Dan's bleak estimations, if only several million people died as a result of this kind of scenario, it could be considered a positive outcome. He'd seen it all, but no matter how many times he tried to articulate this to his superiors, he wasn't listened to. They didn't take him or the threat that SCP-096 posed seriously. Every time he warned of the apocalyptic potential of SCP-096, he was simply told to get back to working on those goggles. It was why he needed to give those naysayers a demonstration. It was why a certain photograph needed to show up in the home of a certain mountaineer. It's why all those people had to die. There was no other way. The deaths of the civilians and the researchers and the mobile task force members were, of course, regrettable. But it was the only way to prevent the deaths of so many more. They gave him what he wanted. Permission to put this gangly time bomb in the ground. Even if the beast's death was inextricably tied to his own execution at the hands of the very employers who authorized him. The world was full of funny little ironies like that. Another one is that even though Dr. Dan now had the authorization and funding to terminate SCP-096, he was discovering that he lacked another important factor, the capability. They tried incinerating it, exposing it to massive amounts of radiation, exposing it to an insane degree of kinetic trauma, the equivalent of being hit by an out-of-control bullet train. They tested every kind of experimental, off-the-books weaponry that they had access to through various research projects. Proton blasts, lasers, high-intensity energy beams, nothing. Even when they fried off every scrap of flesh on the monster's body, its unbreakable skeleton still remained, and in what seemed like no time at all, it'd be back in action. Its very existence seemed to mock him. A guard opened his cell door, staring disdainfully at the disgraced researcher. That same guard had slammed his head against a wall a month earlier. One of his friends had apparently been killed in the legendary 096 containment breach that set this whole sordid thing in motion. Up and at him, scumbag, he said in a gruff, surly voice, training a handgun on the doctor he knew wouldn't fight back. They need you in test chamber six. Dr. Dan allowed himself a small grin imperceptible to the guard who clearly hated his guts. They'd approved his 096 versus 682 cross-test. Marvelous. How marvelous. To all the others, it would seem like just one more entry in a long line of 682 cross-tests. He thought it darkly funny. In his eyes, the Foundation had no hope of ever killing SCP-682. Its defining quality was being impossible to kill and it didn't present nearly the threat to the entire world that 096 posed. Their futile attempts to murder the lizard were little more than a money sink to justify the site's exorbitant funding. But perhaps he could turn this to his benefit. Maybe SCP-682 would hold the secret to actually killing off his nemesis. 
Within 30 hours, Dr. Dan had his disappointing answer. Both anomalies had undeniably done a real number on each other, and Dr. Dan did take a kind of sick amusement in the mental trauma that SCP-682 had induced in 096. But ultimately, it was all for nothing. 682 had skinned 096 alive and melted off its flesh with acid, but once again, that indestructible skeleton stood firm. This had been the 27th termination attempt since the incident. The 27th failed termination attempt, Dr. Dan mentally corrected himself. 096's skeleton kept defeating them. Even their most ardent attempts to penetrate the bones and destroy the creature within had failed. During a previous attempt, they tried to access the brain by putting a diamond-hard drill into its eye sockets. Of course, it was the drill that actually broke, much to Dr. Dan's seemingly tireless frustration. Needless to say, in the debriefing interview with Dr. Carver, a researcher who once would have considered him a colleague, he wasn't in high spirits. If he managed to kill this thing, then he would always be the hero who made a terrible sacrifice in order to save many more lives. If he didn't kill 096, he was little more than the monster who murdered all those innocent people for nothing. Though you'd never hear him say it out loud. If it wasn't for that damnable, indestructible skeleton, this monster would be long dead already. If only there was some way to break the creature's bones. That's when it hit him. SCP-173, The Sculpture. A Site-19 icon often overlooked because of its more silent but deadly style, but undeniably one of the most frightening and dangerous anomalies out there. It had racked up a truly shocking body count since it was first interred at Site-19 in 1993, one broken neck at a time, and it's one of the few creatures out there that even the hard-to-destroy reptile himself is utterly terrified of. Perhaps a monster that practically has a PhD in breaking bones would be the ideal candidate to vandalize the Shy Guy's vertebrae. Once his proposal was greenlit for initial testing, Dr. Dan arranged for the Shy Guy, with a bag over his head of course, to be brought into a testing chamber with the ever-stoic SCP-173. When all of the researchers and guards were safely outside, all it took was a single blink to make all of Dr. Dan's darkest dreams come true. In the nanoseconds his eyes were closed, he heard the most beautiful sounds in the world. A loud, fleshy crunch and a pained howl from 096. He opened his eyes to an equally wondrous sight. 096 doubled over at an unnatural angle. Its spine snapped between the fourth and fifth vertebrae, spinal fluid leaking down the creature's flank. That freaky little sculpture had done it. It had actually damaged the integrity of the Shy Guy's skeleton. It was at that moment that Dr. Dan knew he could kill this thing. Admittedly, there was a containment breach shortly after that when the bag slipped off of 096's head, and it charged through the nearby steel wall, killing multiple people before being subdued and recontained. But when it comes to projects involving Dr. Dan, a mere handful of innocent people being killed sits comfortably within the acceptable margin of error. A day later, Dr. Dan was standing before a crowded boardroom, with agents, researchers, and even a few members of the O5 Council in attendance. He explained his findings to them, and the fact that even more importantly, they may have a way to bring the wretched existence of 096 to an absolute halt. His plans were approved. Not long after, he was putting them into motion. Dr. Dan was surrounded by researchers and heavily armed guards as 173 was escorted into the test chamber with a forklift. 096 was there, still bagged. Off to the side was a giant tub of hydrofluoric acid connected to a hose and injector attachment. If this didn't work, nothing would. Everyone stood back in a safe zone as 173 was released to do its thing. Crunch. Just like the previous time, 096's spine had been successfully snapped. Spinal fluid dribbled down its skin. Everyone had rushed into the chamber. One group kept 173 isolated with their stairs. The other, headed by Dr. Dan, prepared the acid injector and shoved it into the breach in 096's spine. As the acid was pumped by the gallon into 096's bones, the creature let out the most horrifying wail. It kicked and bucked as more acid was pumped in melting those indestructible bones from within. 
The creature even began to vomit acid as it panicked, melting the bag off of its own head. Some panicked and averted their gaze. Dr. Dan didn't. He stared directly at the creature's face for the first time as it melted in front of him with nothing short of pure elation. Had he won? Had he actually won? The creature let out a gurgling shriek and the guards opened fire. Their bullets splattered into the monster's melting flesh and bones as it hollered and shrieked. They didn't let up, firing up and down its body, spraying it with white-hot lead. It began to melt and bubble away, expanding into a great, gruesome puddle on the floor beneath them. Dr. Dan laughed like a madman. Even as the guards grabbed him and dragged him away from the foul-smelling, greasy mess, bubbling with chemical life, he just kept laughing. Even though he knew the death of 096 meant an equally swift death of his own, it didn't matter. It had all been for something. The world was saved. It was over. He'd finally won. What do you do when the sun turns wrong? When light, which once represented life, joy, and warmth, becomes a symbol of death and destruction, do you hide inside? Shutter the windows, keep out the light by any means necessary? Do you retreat underground, where the sun's rays cannot penetrate, burrowing into the dark and the cold? Do you simply give yourself to it, accepting that there is no escaping something so vast, so far reaching as sunlight itself, and allow yourself to be lost in the end of all things. We've covered this possibility before. SCP-001, when day breaks, or SD Locke's proposal. It's difficult to know what any given person might do in such harrowing circumstances. After all, we have always learned to love the light and fear the darkness. It turns our very understanding of reality upside down to have that paradigm shifted, the dark becoming safety, and the light becoming death. The source of all life on Earth, of all warmth, transforming in an instant from the sun as we know it to an Apollyon-class SCP that melts all living organisms that cross into its gaze. But what about a being that has always feared the light? Something that prioritizes solitude and never ever wants to be seen? How might it live out those darkened days? Today, we're taking a look at what happens when Daybreak meets a familiar face, even if a constantly hidden one. SCP-096 SCP-096, or the Shy Guy, is something of a celebrity around here. It is a humanoid creature with long, distended arms, pale skin, and a jaw that can open four times wider than an ordinary human's. There is only one thing above all else that this entity desires for no one to see its face. When someone views its face, it flies into an uncontrollable rage and seems to have no other option but to destroy the person who has seen it. So, it is unlikely that a creature so intent on solitude would be in much danger from the transformed sun. In fact, it might even be a positive thing, and for some time it was. With so many human beings gone, reduced to gelatinous masses with no desire but to slither around in the ghoulish sunlight and merge with one another, there were fewer people to observe his face than ever. He could stay inside and know with almost complete certainty that no one would come to bother him. No one was coming to look at him and there were no more visitors, researchers poking and prodding that might sneak a look at his face. And so he stayed there, in the room that had served as his containment unit before the world turned upside down. The masses of flesh that once were humans did not concern him, as they never looked at his face. All he did was stay in his room and never go outside. The outside frightened him terribly, though he was not concerned with the deadly sunlight or the possibility of it melting him as it had so many others. He was much more afraid that someone, some unlikely survivor clinging to their original life, might look at him, that they might see his face. That was simply too distressing to risk. He would much rather stay alone in his old cell weeping softly in the shadows. One day, though we couldn't say how many days after the end of things it had been, 
he was weeping alone in his former cell. The days blurred together, spent the same way, and time had lost much of its meaning. Through the echoing sound of his sobs and the sloshing sounds of the creatures outside, a woman's voice cut through. It was faint, but he could make out what she was saying. She was calling out for help, asking if anyone had any food or fresh water. The sound was getting louder, closer, accompanied by the disconcerting thump of her footsteps. She was coming down the hall, as much as it could be called a hall anymore. She was coming towards his room to disrupt his miserable peace. He heard her steps cross the threshold of his room, and her voice broke into a terrified scream. No doubt at the unexpected sight of a pale, naked creature weeping in the corner of what she expected to be an empty room. Startled by the first loud sound he'd heard in a long time, in a world that had mostly been silent since the initial outpouring of agonized screams had faded into the soft slap of flesh and slime on the ground, he turned around. He shouldn't. Ordinarily, he wouldn't. But he couldn't stop himself. There he saw a woman. Wide eyes filled with tears, face streaked with dirt, a small child next to her holding her hand and clinging to her leg. Just as he saw the woman, she saw him. She saw his face. Anger boiled over inside of him, and he let out a scream, wild, primal, and filled with inhuman rage. She could not be looking at him, seeing his face. He couldn't let her. The woman ran with the child in tow, panicked by the wild roar and the sight of him standing upright before her. The anger faded as she left his sight, making her way down the hall and to the stairs. But then he remembered. She had seen his face. He could not let her leave. It was time to do something he never thought he'd have to do again. Hunt. His heightened senses picked up the sound of muffled footsteps coming up through the floor below him. She was downstairs just beneath the floor where he was standing. His instincts kicked in, and his body moved almost of its own accord. He lifted his long, long arms above his head and drove his hands down into the floor. It was weakened by the ravages of the elements and time, and crumbled under his unnatural strength. He dug his claws into the plaster, tearing it apart and cracking it into pieces. He pushed his claws in deeper and deeper until he could feel them breaking through the other side. He pulled the floor apart until the hole was wide enough to fit through, then dropped down to the room below. He spotted the woman's back, fleeing through the door just as he landed. She was getting away. He tore after her, ripping through concrete and steel, destroying everything in his path in a mad dash for the object of his rage. He had to catch her. She could not be allowed to leave. She looked over her shoulder at him, her face a mask of pure terror. She knew, just as he knew, that there was no escape in sight. In his single-minded obsession and her desperation to escape from him, neither of them noticed that she had run so far and so carelessly that she was now outside the building. She had crossed from the shadows into the harsh light of the sun. The woman's eyes widened in grim understanding of her fate. He could only watch helplessly as her body began to succumb to the vicious rays. Almost instantly, she began to melt. As it was closest to the sun, her head was the first to go. Her nose drooped like hot wax, dripping as it went until it slumped off her face and landed on the ground with a sickening splash. Her eyes were next, popping out of their sockets and hanging loose and limp on her cheeks and dangling from sinewy strands. She tried in vain to stuff them back into place, but they squished in her hands like overripe fruit. She attempted to run into the comparative safety of the ruined building, but her feet were already beginning to spread out onto the street, melting into a sticky red smear on the pavement. Her legs crumbled beneath her, and she collapsed to the ground, her face leaving a trail of gelatinous flesh as it landed. She tried uselessly to drag herself along the ground back into the darkness, but her arms were melting into the dirt, mixing with it into a horrible red mud. She let out a last scream of agony, but the sound turned to a thick gurgle as her lips fused together and her mouth melted into nothingness. He watched it all, sobbing and roaring in frustration. She was gone, and he would never get the satisfaction of ending her. The infernal sun had stolen her from him. Now, she was nothing but a wet shadow. 
like the rest of the humans had become long ago. He heard the sound of a soft sob behind him, a tiny human voice. He turned, looking for the source. There was the little girl. He had almost forgotten about her. She was calling out for her mother and crying, and she was looking right at him, right at his face. He waited for the anger to overtake him, but instead, there was nothing. Why wasn't he angry? She was looking at his face, so why? Then he realized. Her eyes were on him, but she did not see him. She was blind. She approached the creature, her arms outstretched following the sound of his crying. She touched his hand with her own tiny fingers, so small and fragile, and asked, Mommy? Then he felt something he had never felt before. Tenderness. Care. A desire to protect this tiny, innocent being. It was the first time he had ever felt warm, ever felt anything but sadness, anger, or fear. Overcome with this softness, he wrapped his arms around the child and hugged her close. She hugged him back tightly, and the room went quiet as they both stopped crying. From that day on, they became a family of sorts. They lived together and he took care of her. She didn't know what he looked like, and had no idea he might be something to fear. To her, he was safety. He was home. For the first time in his long, awful life, he felt like a human instead of a monster. He would scavenge food for her, bring her fresh water, lay down stolen blankets and pillows so she would have a soft place to rest. He even found her a ratty, worn teddy bear amongst the rubble and gave it to her as a gift. She clutched it to her chest and thanked him, and for once his tears were those of joy. In this cursed world, they had found something like happiness in one another. He knew he would protect her, no matter what. Then one day, everything changed. The creature and the little girl were playing in the abandoned site, making up little games together, when he took a break to look out at the window and monitor their surroundings. Outside, the evil red sun waited. When he turned back, the little girl was gone. One of the shadowy creatures, once human, was imitating his voice to lure her away. He could hear it in the distance, and her tiny footsteps following it. He chased after her, the only thing he had ever loved, and saw her just as she stepped out into the light. She screamed as one of her arms began to melt in the light, and he knew what he had to do. He grabbed her and pulled her back inside, using his body to shield her from the horrible rays. As he wept over her, his tears stopped her body from melting any further, but his body continued to fall apart. It was too late for him. He ran as far as he could. Once he transformed, he did not want to end up hurting the girl. He ran until his legs melted away, and he could not run anymore. He had reached the shoreline and stared out at the ocean, unable to move anymore. He screamed a final time in agony, in heartbreak, in mourning for the happiness he had finally found and now would lose. But at least he knew, as his eyes melted away and he was nearly gone, that the girl would be safe. And then he was gone, and the world was quiet. That's right. It's time once again to activate the famed Anomatron 6000 our patented machine that definitely wasn't developed in affiliation with Dr. Wondertainment. We swear. After recalibrating, rebooting, and hitting restart, our infamous specialized supercomputer is ready to bring you all manner of improbable scenarios. We'll simulate encounters between the SCP Foundation's various anomalies and any other character from any other universe you could possibly imagine. Here's a question for you. What do you think would happen if SCP-096, the notorious shy guy, ran afoul of someone he couldn't just kill for daring to look at it? What if the Scourge of the Underworld, Battler of Demons, and the Devil himself set his sights on SCP-096? Well, we're about to hit the button and discover the outcome of SCP-096 versus the dreaded Doomslayer. So, you've heard the old philosophical debate about a tree falling down in the woods, and whether or not nobody being around to hear it brings into question if it actually happened at all, right? 
Well, let's reframe that one a little. If an interdimensional rip in the very fabric of the time-space continuum opens up in an SCP Foundation secure facility and nobody is around to witness it, does a six-foot-tall, 360-pound hulking killing machine still emerge to slaughter everything in his path? It turns out, yes. Yes, he definitely does. Horrified screams and the loud bang of shotgun blasts rang out through the hallway as Foundation researchers ran for their lives. The Doom Marine had just been unceremoniously dropped out of a portal into a strange and unfamiliar environment. Mere minutes earlier, he had been awakened inside a sarcophagus within a facility on Mars in the year 2148. Unfortunately, Doom Guy hadn't had the best start to his day, given that the base he'd woken up in was being overrun by the forces of Hell itself. Thanks to a rogue scientist opening up portals to the underworld and allowing all manner of demonic abominations to come pouring through. So naturally, when another portal brought the armor-clad Demon Slayer to a site run by the SCP Foundation, the intensity of battle had led to the Doom Slayer believing that the unsuspecting staff were actually all demons in disguise. And to him, the only good demon is one he got to send back to hell in the most brutal fashion imaginable. He wasn't going to stop until he'd torn through wave after wave of Foundation personnel, thinking perhaps if he killed enough, he'd be returned to his previous locale for more demon killing. As the Foundation dispatched its security forces and mobile task forces to take down the unstoppable force of Carnage decked out in head-to-toe green armor, it seemed nothing they could throw at the Doom Marine was enough to take him down. A hail of bullets rained down on him from the MTF's weapons, ricocheting ineffectually off his protective plating as he continued his assault, remaining tireless thanks to his immense physical conditioning. The SCP Foundation tried and failed to contain Doom Guy. They assumed him to either be a new, undocumented anomaly, or a violent and unhinged maniac from the Church of the Broken God. Given his armor resembling cybernetic augmentations and machine parts grafted to his body, along with his arsenal of advanced weaponry. But there were no enhancements, no augmentations made to the Doom Slayer. He may have once been mortal, but centuries of killing demons had allowed him to transcend ordinary human physiology. He did not tire, never lost strength, never needed to eat or drink, and was near enough a mortal. Yet among all the chaos that was unfurling, a solitary researcher had just managed to slip out of the Doom Slayer's reach. He ran as fast and far as he was physically able. The mobile task force troops were getting eviscerated, and the Slayer could easily tear through the whole Foundation. Then, fleeing for his life, the researcher had an idea. Either a stroke of genius or total idiocy, and a risky move either way. He would send an anomaly on the Doom Slayer. He turned to the nearest containment cell, a windowless room with a heavy locked door. Hurriedly inputting his security clearance code, the researcher heaved the door open and covered his eyes with his arm. It wouldn't have been his first choice of SCP to send into battle. SCP-096's cell was the closest. Lumbering out of its containment chamber on its misshapen, elongated legs, SCP-096 scanned the area. Alarms were blaring. It was loud and frightening to the timid, albeit terrifying creature. It reached up to cover its ears in bewilderment. Not that the researcher who had freed it could see what it was doing. For one, his eyes were still covered, and for another, he was already dead, thanks to the Doomslayer barging shoulder first through a nearby wall and raining debris onto the nearby researcher. Beneath the visor of his helmet, the Marine breathed heavily, panting but not tiring, as he looked at the pale, skinny creature in the corridor before him, who was clutching the sides of its head, its huge jaw hung open. As far as the Slayer knew, he was making progress. His attack was working. He'd killed enough of these demonic imposters that they were starting to reveal their true forms. Although in all his years of bloodshed and being a scourge to the denizens of Hell, he hadn't quite ever seen a demon that looked like the Shy Guy. Not that it mattered to Doom Guy. Before long, it'd be dead like all the rest. The towering, stick-thin creature turned to face the armor-adorned warrior and shrieked. Immediately overcome with anguish, having a full-blown breakdown as it often did whenever someone looked at it. As the demon killer stomped down the corridor towards it, 
The Doom Blade, a long, sleek, razor-sharp edge extended from the Slayer's gauntlet where it was mounted on his wrist. He reached down and yanked the ripcord on his chainsaw, too. He was long overdue for a glory kill. But before he could strike at SCP-096, the Shy Guy moved with impossible speed, faster than even the Doom Marine himself. It zipped behind the encroaching Marine, moving quicker than he could perceive. One second SCP-096 was crying and wailing in front of him, then not even a full second later, the creature was towering over Doom Guy from behind. SCP-096 gripped the Doom Blade and snapped it with ease, like breaking a twig before reaching its other long arm down and pulling the chainsaw from Doom Guy's hand. The motorized blade was still running as it clattered to the ground, cutting a hole through the floor and falling down into the lower level of the facility. Enraged as he very often was, the Doom Slayer reached both arms back behind his head and gripped the elongated torso of SCP-096. The virtually immortal killing machine hurled the creature over his head with ease, thanks of course to his immense strength. Doom Guy could lift objects far heavier than most ordinary humans, and carry heavy weapons without tiring. He had even grappled hand-to-hand -hand with demons. Throwing the Shy Guy down the corridor like hurling a basketball was no trouble for the spacefaring slaughterer of Satan's spawn. Screaming and howling in pain, SCP-096 crashed to the ground at the far end of the corridor, tumbling over itself thanks to its long limbs before landing in a confused heap. As the Shy Guy reoriented itself, struggling back onto its feet and standing up at its full height, it was instantly knocked back down as the force of something struck it. Barring down on SCP-096, the Doom Machine charged, his signature double-barreled sawed-off shotgun drawn. It was hardly leaving a scratch on SCP-096's pale skin, despite the moderate amount of damage the weapon was capable of. Two shots would ring out, reeling the creature but not harming it. Then, by the time SCP-096 managed to recover from the blast, the Slayer had finished reloading in time to open fire yet again. Even as the Doom Slayer raced nearer, closing the distance between him and what he thought to be another demon for him to kill, the shotgun seemed to have little effect against the Shy Guy at close range. Stowing the weapon, Doom Guy put all of his focus and energy into his charge, heavy boots stomping against the ground as he raced towards the Shy Guy still stunned by the latest shotgun blast. Before the creature could steady itself, this time it was struck by another force, a heavy object barreling towards it. The Doom Slayer shoulder barged SCP-096, sending the pair of them crashing through the nearest wall. They burst into a neighboring room, with the Doom Slayer keeping a single-armed grip around the Shy Guy, while repeatedly delivering vicious punches to its gut with his other hand, not once relenting. SCP-096 screeched in pain, clawing at the Slayer, but unable to tear through his impenetrable armor. As they crashed through yet another wall, SCP-096 did something it rarely ever did. In fact, maybe something it had never ever done before. It ran away from someone that had looked at it. While the creature was deeply insecure and so self-conscious that it would kill anyone who saw so much as a photograph of it, it didn't often feel afraid. But the Doom Slayer, this muscle-bound killing machine that had brutally butchered actual demons was so imposing, so threatening, and so effective at dispensing painful punishment that he scared the fight out of SCP-096. Sobbing with terror, the creature zipped away using its anomalous speed, trying desperately to put as much distance between it and the Doom Marine as it possibly could. But therein lay the problem. No sooner had SCP-096 gotten away from the scourge of hell than the creature immediately felt the familiar pull. Whether it was an inescapable compulsion to kill everyone who looked at it, or the fact of the Shy Guy's biology, it could only distance itself from the Slayer for a few seconds before it reappeared next to him. From the Doom Guy's perspective, it seemed like the creature was intentionally disappearing and reappearing, using its teleportation-like speed to evade a volley of his attacks. SCP-096 came at him again, stuck in a loop of trying to attack the Doom Slayer for looking at it, to immediately regretting that course of action and fleeing in fear of its hulking, heavy weapon-toting target. Doom Guy drew every weapon he had in his arsenal, launching a barrage of high-explosive ordnance from his rocket launcher to try and kill SCP-096. The resulting damage practically reduced an entire wing of the Foundation site to rubble, but still couldn't kill the Slayer's opponent. 
Meanwhile, in the moments that the Shy Guy temporarily forgot his own fear for the Doom Guy, it managed to rush towards him, swiping the Marine's various technologically advanced armaments out of his hands, before instantly remembering why he was so scared of the green armored force of destruction and dashing away. Doom Guy's supply of weapons had all but depleted. Neither he nor SCP-096 were getting tired out by their constant back and forth. They were locked in a stalemate, until the Shy Guy tried to get back to its cell. Zipping away once again, it cowered in the corner, reaching for an old worn-out paper bag that had slipped over its head. It sat down, trembling, rocking back and forth in a fetal position. The Shy Guy was terrified. An overwhelming, debilitating fear gripped it. Fear that became pure dread as the sound of heavy boots began to stomp closer and closer. Kicking the steel door off its hinges, the Doomslayer walked into SCP-096's cell, carrying something huge in his hands. It was one of the most devastating weapons Doom Guy had at his disposal, capable of unleashing untold destruction, the BFG-9000. Without remorse, not caring that the creature seemed to have retreated and was cowering away from him, the Slayer raised the powerful weapon and fired an enormous ball of green energy. The blast engulfed the entire room, tendrils snaking out from the energy projectile, causing additional damage to the surrounding area, until there was nothing left of SCP-096. Imagine knowing that there's a monster right under your nose. Imagine knowing that this monster is capable of killing any human being on Earth, and all because they simply saw a photograph of its face. When this monster is on the warpath, literally nothing can stop it. No weapon that human beings have invented is capable of even slowing it down. Imagine knowing, in the age of mass media, of clicks and shares, of 24-hour news, smartphones, and limitless social media connecting billions across the globe, that one stray picture of this monster leaked in the wrong place could cause the end of the world as we know it. And this fateful, terrifying day could come at any time. Congratulations, you now know how it feels to be Dr. Dan, the hot-headed lead SCP Foundation researcher on the SCP-096 case. The anomaly itself requires no real introduction. The infamous mass-murdering shy guy has haunted the nightmares of Foundation experts for years, but nobody is more haunted by this thing than Dr. Dan himself. For over a decade now, he has firmly believed that there's one solution to the 096 problem, Termination with extreme prejudice. In his eyes, to think that 096 is ever truly contained is an illusion. They could never be sure of how many pictures of it are out there, floating around just waiting to be seen, like a time bomb waiting to go off. The resources spent containing it and cleaning up after its rampages, he would often argue, would be better spent instead figuring out how to finally kill it. But seeing as we're talking about the SCP Foundation here, not the Global Occult Coalition. The O5 Council didn't see it quite the same way. They constantly overturned Dr. Dan's termination requests, leaving the paranoid researcher more furious with each rejection. He tried to warn them again and again and again. Don't you see? It's like a stick of dynamite, and the fuse is already lit. If you don't let me put it out before it's too late, there won't even be anyone left to pick up the pieces. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. Until, of course, Incident 096-1-A. A dark and bloody day still looked back on with shame and horror by even the most hardened members of Foundation staff. It was the day that SCP-096 gave everyone a taste of the mass carnage it was truly capable of. Dr. Dan wasn't even there when containment was first breached. He was off on an expedition in the snowy mountains where 096 was first found, trying to discover clues to its true origin. Dr. Dan's second-in-command, Dr. Oleksi, was also lucky enough to be outside of the containment area when the Shy Guy escaped. According to interviews he gave at debriefing tribunals, he was in the break room, treating himself to a warm cup of joe. All the other personnel assigned to 096's containment and research were near its containment chamber, a giant cube made of reinforced metal, observing a live feed of data being collected from the cube's interior. 
As usual, sensors indicated that 096 was pacing within. For obvious reasons, the Foundation doesn't maintain any kind of live visual surveillance on 096. It wouldn't be worth the risk. But what seemed like an otherwise quiet day suddenly took a turn for the insane. The monitors began displaying terrifying data, indicating an imminent containment breach as the wails of the creature within the cube echoed out through its metal walls. Some tried to run. Others did all they could to engage emergency procedures, while guards armed with heavy weaponry rushed into the room. They all knew in their hearts that it wouldn't save them, but what else could they do? A huge dent bulged out from the side of the cube, then another, before the metal was torn open like tissue paper as the furious hands of the Shy Guy began clawing their way through it. Secondary layers of protection were deployed, but they didn't help. 096 just kept ripping through all the barriers. As everyone in attendance knew, once it was in its rage state, nothing could stop it. Literally, nothing. The guards attempted to fire on the anomaly, but their bullets did no good. As the creature burst free, most of the people in the room had at least momentary visual contact with its face. In response, Code Lima was declared, and the entire chamber was flooded with a fast-acting nerve gas, killing everyone. Everyone except for 096 itself, of course. Within two minutes, 096 had broken free of the entire containment site and began running through the desert at breakneck speeds towards its distant target. The Foundation needed to act fast and find a way to stop it before it hit a population center where the death toll would skyrocket. Team Echo Romeo were dispatched to pursue the creature in a heavily armed attack helicopter while MTF Tau-1, a task force specializing in SCP-096 containment and recovery, forged ahead to identify the anomaly's target, designated 096-1, and to move any other civilians out of harm's way. Dr. Dan was alerted of the disastrous situation and offered guidance to both teams from afar. Echo Romeo's chopper pursued 096, barely able to keep up. Dr. Dan recommended attempting to at least slow the creature down with heavy arms fire, even though he knew actually stopping it would be impossible. A member of the team used a modified XM500 anti-material rifle to fire several rounds at the creature, but even the shot that passed directly through its head appeared to have no effect on it. But at least they had a lock on its direction now. 096 always travels in a straight line, directly towards its target smashing through any obstacles in its way. This means its intended direction is relatively easy to track, and people in the path of its trajectory are even easier to save. But it's a high-pressure job reserved for MTF Tau-1. Tau-1 passed over Echo Romeo and 096 in a series of eight V-22 Ospreys, hoping beyond hope that they could outrun the creature, since there were several different towns in its direct path. But thanks once again to the one and only Dr. Dan, Echo Romeo and Tau-1 had a secret weapon that neither team had ever possessed before, Scramble. Scramble was an advanced computer program created by Dr. Dan with the help of Dr. Alexi, which was coded into microprocessors for modification into camera feeds and viewing goggles. The program had been fed intricate data concerning every single detail of 096's face, and as the name suggests, when encountering that visual data in real life, it scrambles it beyond recognition. In theory, it would make it far safer for operatives to be around SCP-096 without activating its rage state. In theory, it wasn't long before disaster struck. 096 had made its way onto I-40 and had begun attacking vehicles it encountered, killing the people inside. By this point, it had already outrun the Echo Romeo chopper, rendering them essentially useless. Tau-1 just had to forge ahead along 096's trajectory and try to get as many people out of the danger zone as possible, until 096-1 was located and destroyed by the anomaly. Years of training for an awful day like this had paid off as the first three towns along 096's path were successfully evacuated. The Shy Guy just ran right through all of them, and no lives were lost. The same, however, could not be said for town number four. As was standard procedure, Tau-1 had everyone in the town gathered up and blindfolded. The entire team in attendance had modified night vision goggles with scramble microprocessors, so in theory, they were better off than most from 096 if things went south. The Tau-1 members tried in vain to keep everybody in line, 
They were threatening to shoot anyone who dared to remove their blindfold when 096 finally appeared. It tripped during its approach, rolling and shattering through several houses. Chaos erupted. Some people instinctively removed their blindfolds to see what was going on, and panicked members of Tau-1 began firing into the crowd. The screams of the civilians and the bursts of gunfire were all drowned out by the horrific wailing of 096 itself, as it tore through everyone and everything to kill the unfortunate souls who had seen its face. And given how many had removed their blindfolds during the initial pandemonium, SCP-096 had a huge number of the townspeople on its list. 096 located and grabbed the original 096-1, the person that had first glimpsed its face and caused all of this. But in the grand scheme of things, he was just one more body on the pile that day. Though of course we mean this in a purely metaphorical sense. 096 never leaves entire bodies. The Foundation operatives in attendance were able to figure out what had caused all this madness and death. 096-1 had been an amateur mountaineer and spent his vacations hiking around any mountain ranges he could gain access to, including the mountain range that 096 had been inhabiting prior to its initial capture and containment. But he hadn't actually seen 096 on that fateful trip, which had been taken over a decade ago. But in a photograph taken that day of himself, standing on a picturesque mountainside, 096 made a cameo. It took up all of four pixels, a tiny off-white dot against the snow on the back right side of the photograph. This photograph, with all the deadly potency of an atom bomb, had been sitting there for years, waiting. When the mountaineer was looking through old photos that morning and his eyes passed over those few blurry pixels, he didn't have any idea that he had just laid his eyes on one of the most dangerous anomalies the world has ever seen. But you don't have to know. Only 096 does. As Tau-1 led by their commander Major Jack Wilford tried to retake control of the situation, things got even worse. It turned out Dr. Dan's scramble technology, the one thing that was supposed to have given them an edge in this situation, didn't actually work. As soon as goggle-wearing members of the team laid eyes on 096, it entered its rage state and started massacring them. It tore many of the mobile task force members to shreds, including a number of the operatives required for piloting the eight Ospreys. It was a disaster of truly epic proportions, and the catastrophic failure of Dr. Dan's scramble technology was a key factor. The root of the technology's failure was easy enough to figure out. Dr. Dan's scramble microprocessors worked fast, but not fast enough. Fractions of a second glimpses of 096's face managed to get through, and that was more than enough to set 096 off. Echo Romeo and MTF Epsilon arrived shortly afterwards to clean up the mess. It'd been a disaster of such magnitude that even a CNN reporter arrived on the scene and started filming before being promptly shut down by Epsilon. It was a member of Echo Romeo that finally slipped the bag over a docile 096's head, preparing it for containment once again, the creature now content that it had eliminated all of the unfortunate souls who had seen its face. He'd found 096 sitting next to a minivan that had its roof ripped off, the young family inside being the last to have seen its face. And things were so awful in the aftermath of the containment breach that the O5 Council changed their tune, finally granting Dr. Dan permission to terminate 096 by any means necessary. It's terrifying to think that all this can unfold because of a couple of poorly timed accidents, but it's probably even more terrifying to consider that it wasn't an accident at all. It seemed awfully convenient that both Dr. Dan and Dr. Alexei were far from danger when all hell broke loose. It was also convenient that, despite the failure of his technology being a major reason why the breach was as deadly as it was, Dr. Dan had still come out of the situation with everything he wanted. The Foundation also found this strange, and the more they looked into it, the more they found details that didn't add up. Alibis began to fall apart. Coincidences didn't seem so coincidental, and eventually a weak link in the chain was identified. Dr. Alexei. Under pressure from the Foundation, Alexei spilled everything. Dr. Dan had essentially orchestrated the entire containment breach, 
and on top of that, he did everything he could to make it as deadly as possible. All with the purpose of getting the O5 Council to see things his way, and finally give him the permission he needed to devote all of the SCP-096 resources to its termination. But it came at a terrible price to Dr. Dan personally. For his crimes against the Foundation and humanity, he was permitted to try and figure out a way to terminate 096 once and for all. But as payment for his crimes, he himself would also be terminated as soon as his task was complete. Were the lives of all those innocent people, and Dr. Dan himself, worth the price of finally being authorized to terminate SCP-096? When asked why he did all of this, Dr. Dan simply said, It worked. There was only a matter of time until that happened in a major population center and its face spread over the world news. I can kill 096, but I've killed myself in the process. While we don't agree with his methods, there's something almost admirable about a person so single-mindedly devoted to their cause. It happened in 1981, in a small rural village in West Germany. Siegfried Geis, nine years old, ran across the bitter snow, tears freezing to his cheeks. It was Christmas Day, and not long ago he'd been so happy. He was celebrating with his family, his mother, his father, and his young sister, the centers of his universe, when that monster had attacked and destroyed everything he'd ever known. The White Terror, the Destroyer of Christmas Cheer, the Yule Man, SCP-4666. Though, of course, young Siegfried had no idea. In hindsight, Siegfried's parents had been noticing strange things in the lead-up to Christmas Day. Unfamiliar bumps and knocks. Strange smells coming from the attic. The occasional tall, dark silhouette on the horizon outside their isolated old farmhouse. But in all the hustle and bustle of the season, nobody really paid the proper attention to all the signs of an incoming Hoisnacht event. Every eerie feeling was just written off as stress or overactive imaginations. None of the Geist family knew about the true danger they were facing until they woke up to see the Yule Man standing over them, sharpening a rusty blade and staring at them with hungry, sadistic eyes. Merry Christmas. The creature rasped and chuckled. Siegfried was lucky to escape alive, but of course he would never see his family again. He'd be picked up a day or so later, traumatized, catatonic, and almost frozen to death. When he was finally able to speak again, he spoke of a monster having killed his family. When the police investigated his home and found the remains, they deemed it to be the work of an all-too-human serial killer, and poor Siegfried Geis was entered into the foster system. Years of work with psychiatric professionals tried to convince young Siegfried that the monster he claimed to see the unnaturally tall, gnarled, bony freak with those shimmering black eyes was merely a product of his trauma. But he knew the truth. He always knew. What he encountered that day, the thing that took his family, was nothing less than a true monster. And at nine years old, Siegfried made a vow he would one day kill the monster, no matter what it took. When Siegfried was finally adopted and returned to school, he did everything he could to apply himself academically. He had no interest in friends or romantic relationships, even as he grew into his teenage years. The only thing that drew his interest, in addition to the perfection of his academic life, was his own private research into the supernatural. He became an expert in all things occultic and anomalous, sightings of ghosts, phantoms, aliens, and monsters. He wanted to know it all. No, needed to know it all. He would arm himself with knowledge, wanting to know everything he could in advance of the confrontation that would be his final destiny. He also began obsessively researching attacks similar to the ones that killed his family, and found an eerie pattern seemingly to unfold all over the Northern Hemisphere. During the 12 days of Christmas, entire families would be found dead in their homes, mutilated horrifically, often with children having gone completely missing. They happened far enough apart in terms of time and space that no connection was drawn between the events, all just random attacks according to the police and media. 
Weren't the connections obvious? He didn't understand it. It was almost like there was some kind of sweeping cover-up, obscuring the true culprit behind all these killings. The same beast that destroyed his life. As Siegfried, now known to most as Dr. Geis, ascended through his time at university, he became one of Germany's foremost scholars on the occult, with several published papers and books that drew fascination of fellow experts and laymen alike. But most importantly of all, Siegfried's work got the attention of the SCP Foundation. They reached out to the ambitious rising star of the paranormal world and offered him a research position. Dr. Geis was elated and said that he would happily take the role if they answered one question for him. Did they know anything about a horrific humanoid monster that attacked families across the Northern Hemisphere around Christmas time? This was the moment when Dr. Siegfried Geis, after decades of searching, finally came to know about SCP-4666. He had access to all of the SCP Foundation's information on the monster, putting him several steps closer to what had always been his ultimate goal, killing that godforsaken thing. But this would be easier said than done. After all, if the Yule Man was easy to track, the Foundation would have captured and contained him long before now. His attacks could occur anywhere across the Northern Hemisphere, making catching him the world's largest game of whack-a-mole. But this was a game that Dr. Geis had more than enough patience to play. Over the following years, Dr. Geis worked as hard as humanly possible, not just at the case of SCP-4666, but at every piece of work the Foundation had to offer him. Much like his ruined childhood, Geis made no effort to interact, no effort to form social connections. He just worked and worked and worked and worked with single-minded passion, soon developing a reputation as one of the most hardworking and dependable figures in the SCP Foundation's European division. It was this kind of work ethic that soon saw him promoted to senior researcher and then a site director. He had more control over information, resources, and manpower than ever before. It was almost time. He could sense it. Delegating other tasks to his subordinates, Dr. Geis began to work on his masterpiece, an advanced algorithm connecting police, social media, and surveillance databases across the Northern Hemisphere. You see, while Dr. Geis had never faltered in his quest, neither had the Yule Man. Every year, more families disappeared or were horrifically murdered, and every death weighed on Guy's. He saw them as a personal failing of his, of his inability to fulfill his destiny. But the Yule Man was a creature of habit, and it would be that very adherence to habit that Guy's used to destroy it. Using the algorithm he created, they would perfectly track and triangulate the home most likely to be the subject of a dreaded Riesnacht event, with greater accuracy and precision than ever before. The year was 2022. Dr. Geis was convinced that this time, he would be the one to claim victory and vengeance. There was one thing he didn't tell his Foundation compatriots, though. As he put the pieces in place for the final showdown, he had no intention of containing the Yule Man. This time, he would destroy it. Using his newfound influence as a well-respected site director, he requested the transfer of a few high-profile anomalies, as well as the services of a crack mobile task force death squad. It was time. The Yule Man watched the house from a distance. He'd been observing for days, watching the nice, happy family within. What pleasure it would bring him to destroy them and take what's left to his workshop for further fun. Tonight would be the night that he claimed them. They were all blissfully unaware, and lived in an isolated rural area where nobody but him would hear all the wonderful screaming. The second the lights went out inside the house, he would strike, and bring about some Christmas fear. When the last window went dark, the Yule Man drew a long, rusty blade out of his bag of tricks and approached the house. He crept in through one of the windows. Locks had never been a problem for him. This whole process had played out hundreds of times. He barely even needed to think about it now. He crept in past the presents around the Christmas tree, found the stairs and began to climb. He'd find them in their beds, one by one, and take his time, savoring the pain, savoring the fear. He went into the youngest one's bedroom first. His lips pulled back into a manic grin. There was the little boy, tucked in under his quilt, like a present waiting to be unwrapped. 
He grabbed the sheet with his long, gnarled fingers and pulled it back, only to see a plastic dummy underneath, with a stun grenade fixed to its chest. Before the Yule Man could even react, the stun grenade exploded into his face, blinding him with a sudden white light and ringing in his ancient ears. The next thing he heard was a rugged military voice yelling, Squad Alpha, move in! Seconds later, the upstairs landing was filled with mobile task force operatives with assault rifles. They aimed an open fire into the Yule Man, peppering him with painful bullets. He wasn't used to his victims fighting back like this. Truthfully, it even caught him off guard. But sadly for those brave task force operatives, it would not be enough to kill him. The Yule Man gripped his rusty knife and lunged at Squad Alpha. Moments later, they were all dead, and the furious Yule Man was trudging back down the stairs. There had been no satisfaction in this slaughter. How had they caught him like this? Perhaps he'd go eat some of his servants in his workshop to make himself feel better. As he walked back across the living room, past the Christmas tree, past all the presents, the television flickered into life. Staring at him from the screen was the grinning face of Dr. Siegfried Geis, now 50 years old. And the most insane part was that the Yule Man somehow recognized him, the one who got away. 41 years prior. Hello, old friend. You're looking a little glum, Siegfried said on the screen. I take it that you did not enjoy the surprise party I just threw for you. Don't worry, the night isn't over yet. After all, you haven't even opened your presents. With that, the presents under the tree, which were actually packed with C4 plastic explosives, detonated, leveling the entire house with the Yule Man still inside. The explosion could be heard for miles as a great pillar of smoke rose up into the air. Several hundred meters away, Dr. Siegfried Geis waited and watched, flanked by Foundation agents and more mobile task force soldiers taking in the majesty of the explosion. Dr. Geis remained steely-eyed and watched the blaze. Somehow he knew that even that would not be enough to end the monster permanently. He nodded to the lieutenant he'd brought with him. Squad out! Squad Bravo! Time to engage! The man barked in response. The remaining agents and MTF operatives, armed with assault rifles and submachine guns, descended on the burning wreckage of the house. Moments later, a tall, dark figure, the Yule Man, injured but alive, crawled out of the blaze. Immediately the team opened fire, giving the monster everything they had. But once again, everything was not enough. The creature pulled out two long, rusty knives and leaped into the fray, making short work of the Foundation brass. Soon enough, it stood alone on bloodstained snow, until it caught another bullet in the head. Dr. Siegfried Geis was standing there, the last one alive to face the Yule Man, leveling a revolver. The Yule Man scowled. Geis held his steely gaze. We meet again at long last, Siegfried said. You killed my family. You've killed so many others. Tonight, it is your turn, Yule Man. This is your Wisnacht. Guys opened fire as the Yule Man charged towards him, taking each shot in stride. Even as the Yule Man closed the distance, Guys didn't flinch. His resolve was steely. It made the Yule Man feel confused and furious that he didn't detect an ounce of fear in this man. Even when he drove a knife into the site director's stomach, Siegfried dropped to his knees and collapsed as the Yule Man ripped the knife back out. His gun clattered to the ground. It had been a mortal blow. And still, he seemed unfazed. Why aren't you afraid? The Yule Man growled. Siegfried spat blood and said, You took my family 41 years ago. Everything since then has just been killing time until I got to see them again. Where you're going, all you'll ever see are flames and torment. The Yule Man, furious, stabbed Siegfried again, this time through the heart. The doctor was dying his life's work having seemingly amounted to nothing. But with the last of his strength, he reached into his coat and pulled out something, a little gift he'd requested from one Dr. Alto Clef before putting his plan into action. Dr. Siegfried Geis lifted a photo of SCP-096 right in front of the Yule Man's eyes. Merry Christmas, he said with his last breath. The Yule Man was confused. A photograph? Was that it? Was that really this foolish little boy's trump card after all this time? What a waste. Then, without a moment's warning, SCP-096 barreled into the Yule Man, 
sending them both rolling across the snow. One of Siegfried's preparations was to have SCP-096's containment cube temporarily relocated to only a mile away from the ambush site, to avoid collateral damage. If everything else failed, then SCP-096 would be their Hail Mary pass, their finishing move. And it worked marvelously. As strong and evil as the Yule Man was, he'd been weakened by the night's battle, and the Shy Guy was an order of magnitude more powerful than his sadistic foe. The Yule Man screamed in horror as SCP-096 set upon him with claws and teeth. After hundreds of years inflicting it on others, the Yule Man had died in terror, and Dr. Siegfried Guys had died with a smile on his face. He's waiting for you in the dark. He sits cross-legged, still as a placid lake, and patient as a praying monk six feet deep in meditation. He's been like this for so long, his body oil-slicked with deadly black grease, skin ancient and haggard, eyes black and flat with the kind of calm you'd only find in crawling insects and great white sharks. His lipless mouth is stretched across his jawbone in an ugly black rictus. He may be an old man, but trust us, he's got plenty of new tricks he'd love to show you. He sat in the loneliest place in the world, the deep, dark bowels of an SCP Foundation containment site, surrounded by a complex confluence of containment measures. Different shapes, running liquids, bright lights, the kind of steel so thick a nuclear weapon would only leave it scuffed. All the things that had a tendency to confuse him, because that's all they ever did. The old man laughed to himself very quietly. All the people out there are so scared of him because of one immutable fact. He isn't trapped here, he's just resting. By virtue of his unique anomalous abilities to pass through solids at will and resist any form of physical damage they can dole out, there is no way to really contain him like all the others. All the SCP Foundation could hope to do was make leaving inconvenient enough for him to make his little adventures on the outside less appealing than just sitting around doing nothing. After all, he had all the time in the world. And when you always have a later, there's a lot less pressure to do anything now. But like all thinking creatures, and please be aware that SCP-106, the wretched, terrifying old man, is very much a thinking creature, he was subject to occasional boredom. And when most people are bored, they might play a video game, watch a few YouTube videos, or rewatch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia for the fifth time. But for the old man, killing boredom involved, well, killing people. But not just killing people, of course. Truth be told, for him, killing was really the least entertaining part of the whole affair. The screams, the begging, the desperate pleas, warm tears on shaking cheeks, convulsions of pain, cold sweats, fear so intense it gives way to gibbering madness, the dull sheen of dead hope in their eyes when they realize that their doom is inevitable, and that he, their captor, their torturer, would decide the exact moment they slipped into the void. Of that, that was what he lived for. If you could call what the old man did living. He cracked his neck and licked his teeth. Was he salivating? All those thoughts about pain seemed to have got him worked up. He could feel the distant thumping of his heart, old black blood pumping through the dusty corridors of his vascular system, synapses booming and sparking with excitement at the thought of plumbing new depths of human misery, like a scholar of suffering, a pioneer of pain. All those silly Foundation drones, with the audacity to think they're in control, he'd teach them to scream again. Meanwhile, in the room for the old man's containment chamber, all hell was breaking loose. Monitors on the monster's vitals were all spiking, heart and brain activity peaked, just as they always did before the old man decided to get active. Cameras in his containment chamber showed him rising steadily to his feet, cracking his joints, limbering up. His body started to produce that terrible corrosive mucus at an accelerated rate, pooling around his feet and unleashing squalls of noxious fumes as it melted into the floor. Years of Foundation testing, and they still couldn't find any material that could withstand that vile black slop. 
As the old man began strolling towards the wall, a containment specialist in the control room grabbed a nearby phone and sounded the alarm for the containment breach. They needed a mobile task force, and every guard on site mobilized to tackle 106 before he got into the facility proper and started causing havoc. They couldn't risk it escaping either. The infamous incident, when the old man escaped for a Halloween massacre, still haunted the nightmares of many a staff member. He had to be stopped. Now. A small fighting force was quickly armed and assembled, along with armor and several high-intensity portable lights to hopefully slow the monster down in time for them to grab a D-Class and set up the femur breaker. By the time they all reached the hallway they intended to use as a choke point for the escape, the old man was already halfway through the outer layer of defense, phasing through the wall with that same terrible, manic grin he always had when he was about to inflict terrible violence for the sheer fun of it. The guards and task force members trained their lights and weapons on him. All of them had seen terrible things on the job. The kind of things that would saddle almost anyone with a lifetime of trauma, but almost nothing compared to the horror of direct engagement during a 106 containment breach. That terrible old coffin dodger was hell on two legs. When they discovered to their horror that the lights didn't seem to be slowing him down as much as anticipated, they fell back on plan B. That B standing for blast the living hell out of him with everything they had. The personnel opened fire, pumping round after round into his dark form. While each gave a loud, meaty splatter, the old man didn't even flinch. When he was close enough, all those months of lethargy gave way to sudden, deadly speed. In many ways, the old man was like a crocodile, a fierce and intelligent ambush predator who conserved his energy wisely. He could seem so deceptively languid that you could easily mistake him for something slow and harmless, but when you got within arm's reach, the sudden quickness and ferocity would take you off guard, and by then, it's already too late. Within 30 seconds, the old man was the only thing left alive in that hallway. All the guards and task force operatives sent to slow him down lay dead, dripping with his black mucus. There was silence, save for the quiet fizzing of the mucus eating into their clothes and skin. The old man sighed. How boring. He'd killed so many people now. It all started to seem a little... samey. How many screams could you hear before they all just blended into a single shrill whine? You can get sick of even your favorite meal if you eat it too often. But that didn't matter. The old man had a different order of business today. He happened to be inside an SCP Foundation containment facility, filled with so many fascinating specimens of non-human entities that the one they called SCP-106 simply couldn't wait to torture. He'd only met a small portion of the ones they had contained here, but given what a fascinating experience his past attack on his fellow anomalies was, he couldn't wait to meet some more. Meanwhile, the site's top brass did all they could to try to mobilize a second response to the rogue senior citizen from hell currently strolling through their high-security containment facility. Could they get in contact with other mobile task forces deployed in the area? Maybe they could get Hammerdown or Samsara in on this mess before anything got really out of hand. The old man seemed more intent on something this time. They suspected even the femur breaker might not work in luring him back until he claimed whatever he deemed to be his prize. Maybe they should contact the O5 Council. Security guards were tracking 106's progress through the facility via their vast networks of security cameras. They warned any research, administration, and janitorial staff to clear out of his path, unless they felt like being tortured to death. He hadn't dragged anyone into his pocket dimension yet, so whoever that privilege was reserved for would probably be getting a particular sticky experience. They could only speculate as to the Silent Beast's intentions. One guard noticed something. When cross-referencing 106's movements with a map of the facility, they were able to triangulate where he was heading, straight for the containment chamber of SCP-096. The guard's lips curled into a slight smile, thinking, if one of you freaks can actually kill the other, maybe something positive will come out of this disaster. The old man was having a stroll down memory lane. The time prior, when he broke out of his cell and decided to hassle his fellow inmates was certainly eventful. He wound up in the company of some cantankerous reptile and a Korean foxwoman, an unlikely pair if ever there was one. After finding himself in a room with them, he decided they should have a little more privacy 
and dragged them back into his pocket dimension for further fun. Of course, with two at once, his attention had been a little split. They spent as much time tussling with each other as resisting his attempts to torment them. They definitely put him through his paces that day, and he gave far better than he got. After so many hours of brutal mutilation, there was barely any of the lizard left, despite its frustrating insistence on quickly healing from so many of its wounds. Still, it was good exercise, even if the results had been a little less than satisfying. If he could get another anomaly alone, though, he'd be able to take his time and really savor the pain he caused. Oh, that sounded heavenly. Soon, he came upon an incredibly strange containment chamber that quickly caught his eye. It looked like a huge metal cube with no way in or out, not even a seam. Whatever was trapped in there, the old man thought it must be something that even the fools at the SCP Foundation really, truly wanted nothing to do with. But even more so than the strange sight, it was the sound that drew the old man in, tempting him like a siren song. It was weeping, a soft, sobbing keen that betrayed a bottomless well of misery. Whatever was making that crying sound had known true despair, or whatever passes for true despair before you've had a close encounter with the old man in his pocket dimension. The old man grinned and thought, Oh, Sonny. I'll give you something to really cry about." He stepped forward and faced his way into the metal cube. The creature was in the corner. In contrast to that stupid lizard, this monster was pleasingly humanoid with, presumably, all the familiar pain points. Splendid. The only real difference was color and proportion. It was far longer and ganglier than the average human, with grayish skin and no hair anywhere on its body. Still, it was something the old man could work with. The creature didn't even seem to register his presence. It just sat crumpled in the corner, weeping. Still grinning his lunatic grin, the old man approached and rested a moist hand on the creature's shoulder. Its pale skin began to fizzle from the intruder's corrosive touch. A pool of vile sludge began spreading out beneath his feet until the creature was encompassed too. Little by little, they sank into the old man's favorite place out of the world the pocket dimension, his own personal, eternal, infinite dungeon, where the only laws are pain and terror for all but the old man himself. Little did he know, this time, the scores may be a little more even on that front. They both stood in that terrifying labyrinth of hallways and chambers where the old man had made countless lives infinitely worse than any terrible afterlife that could follow them. And still, this creature didn't seem to change its reaction. He was almost irritated by it. And what's more, this whole time, the creature hadn't even turned to look at him. He'd have to fix that, too. The old man, with his shocking strength, gripped the monster's shoulder and whipped him around, staring into his face, baring his black eyes and manic smile. But he couldn't help find what looked back at him disconcerting. Its eyes were blank and white, its face stretched and warped into a permanent grimace, like Munch's old painting, The Scream. And the second the old man laid eyes on it, that's exactly what it did. Its gaping mouth let out the most terrible wail the old man had ever heard in all his years of torturing. It was a scream of unknowable sadness and fear, but somehow the old man sensed that this creature didn't fear him, it feared itself feared what it was about to do. What the hell had he dragged down here with him? Without warning, the terrible wail soon gave way to sudden and ferocious aggression. Just like the old man had dealt out to a group of Foundation guards and mobile task force agents earlier that same night, it was only out of a mix of pure luck and his own finely tuned animal instinct that the old man was able to dodge the first strike from the creature's long, lithe forelimb. He couldn't believe it. They were in his special place, and this victim of his had the audacity to fight back? Well, he'd soon put this monster in its place. As the monster continued roaring and swiping for him, the old man simply walked backwards into a nearby wall, and disappearing into a black stain. Of course, the monster, better known to the Foundation as SCP-096 or the Shy Guy, simply crashed through the wall to give chase, but on the other side, just another wall. He disappeared. How? Typically, when something sees the face of the Shy Guy, he immediately has a kind of intuitive connection to them. He can sense their presence. It's burned into his mind. 
a homing beacon, an unstoppable imperative. He knows exactly where they are and how to get them, but nothing about this situation was typical. The shy guy felt all the murderous rage he normally did, but the rest was just static. Where was the life he needed to abolish hiding? Suddenly, the old man emerged behind him and forced his hand into the shy guy's back. His fist melted straight through flesh and skin, causing the creature to let out another terrible wail. But as could be expected, they didn't leave a scratch on the shy guy's indestructible skeleton. The shy guy pulled a 180 and swung for the old man again, but he was already gone. Here in the pocket dimension, the old man had the ultimate home turf advantage. Here, space and time were his playthings. In the infinite, twisting, labyrinthian walls of the pocket dimension, the old man wasn't just the devil, he was God, too. But it would take far more than some cheap tricks and bodily harm to dissuade the shy guy from his sole purpose in life. He began running through the old man's personal maze like a crazed lab rat, tearing through wall after wall, forever searching for the monster that trapped it here. He would see the smiling face of that rotten old man every so often, the flash of black eyes and dirty teeth in shadows. But every time it tried to strike the shadows, there would be nothing there. And every time he got a chance, the old man would emerge from the shadows behind the shy guy to strike back, clawing into his flesh and vanishing again before the trapped beast could retaliate. The nasty old sadist was now starting to have some fun. It was a reflex test, a classic game of high-stakes whack-a-mole. And every time the creature failed to strike him, its distress only seemed to grow. This was perfectly fine for the old man. After all, he enjoyed a little mental torment as much as he loved physical torture, and a human would have died or given in to despair long before now. This monster's wonderful mix of resilience and pain made it a great chew toy. The old man kept up this routine, baiting and striking until something unanticipated happened. He appeared, waited for the swing, disappeared as it approached, then reappeared behind the shy guy to deliver another painful strike. This time, however, it seemed his victim had anticipated his pattern. Before he could hit the creature, the shy guy turned, quicker than anything the old man had ever seen, and hit him with such force he flew through several walls in his own maze, shattering them as he went. He hit the ground, stunned by the fact that the shy guy had actually landed a hit, but he wasn't done. The shrieking monster came bounding after him. Before the old man could stand, it struck him again and again and again, pounding his vile body into the ground, which cracked and crumbled. The old man sneered and sank into a puddle of his mucus on the ground. The old man was gone again. SCP-096 screamed in a mix of rage, despair, and frustration, so consumed with its hunt that it didn't notice the pool of corrosive mucus was slowly growing. It began to rise, bubbling and hissing at SCP-096's feet getting deeper and deeper and deeper as the walls rose taller and taller around it. The creature wailed until a tide of the awful stuff reached its face and cascaded down its throat, melting all the organs within. As the creature was fully submerged, SCP-106 manifested atop the wall and looked down, smiling spitefully. He thought, Oh, you may have had me there, boyo, but in the end, I always win. Nothing could survive that. And yet bubbles still rose from the slop below. The old man gritted his rotten teeth and balled his fists in quiet anger. Moments later, back in our dimension, a portal opened in the ground of SCP-096's containment chamber. It vomited out SCP-096's skeleton, smothered in bubbling black goo, and SCP-106. 096 would probably be fully regenerated within a couple of hours, and if 682's encounter with him was anything to go by, probably extremely unwilling to interface with the old man. And the old man himself, who couldn't help but feel a little humiliated by the whole experience, was glad the two of them would probably never meet again. He left the regenerating 096 and commenced the walk of shame back to his containment chamber. They didn't even need the femur breaker. He just felt like having a sit down and processing it all. Nobody else would ever know what happened in the pocket dimension that day, and for the old man's pride, that was probably for the best. But he'd know. He'd always know. By the night's end, he was sitting in his containment chamber again, forlornly wondering, God damn it, old timer. Have you lost your edge? A lot of us wish we could travel the multiverse, pay a visit to another world, and see all the ways in which it differs from this dimension that we call home. 
Maybe there's a decision that you made that altered the course of your entire life. What college you went to, asking somebody out, accepting a job over pursuing a passion. The question of what if might have kept you wondering what your life could have looked like if you picked the other path. Surely it would save you all that wondering and be so much easier just to go and find out. Imagine if you could simply pick a universe where you chose differently, then take a quick jaunt over there to see how things turned out for your other self. But what if you couldn't choose? Never mind whatever that decision was, what if you couldn't pick where in the infinite multiverse you ended up? If traveling from world to world was as random, unpredictable, and instinctive as a sneeze, what then? One moment, you're safe at home, surrounded by everything you know. It might not be perfect, but at least it's familiar. The next thing you know, with the blink of your eyes, you're standing in a world that maybe looks similar, but giant bees are the dominant species instead of humans. Or the world is overrun by spiders, or everyone is made out of paint. Needless to say, you'd be at least a little disoriented, at worst, absolutely terrified for your life. That pretty much sums up the experience of SCP-507, also known as the Reluctant Dimension Hopper. From the outside, he looks to be a mostly normal human man, with blonde hair, green eyes, nothing all that remarkable about him of note, save for him having a somewhat unplaceable accent. Despite having a legal name, SCP-507 will try to squeeze what little enjoyment he can out of introducing himself by a different nickname to everyone he meets. Previous favorites have included Tommy, Steve, Bruto, Guy, Houdini, and Grabnock the Destroyer. We'll stick with Tommy. The sole most intriguing thing about Tommy is that through a process that happens completely without his control, he can spontaneously disappear only to reappear after an unspecified amount of time later. During that time, SCP-507 will have been in a completely different universe to our own. This can happen at any time of day or night, and usually at the most inconvenient moments, including while Tommy is in the middle of a conversation, trying to sleep, or using the, um, <clears throat> facilities. He has no control over when it happens, However, he'll always arrive in an alternate universe in the same geographical spot he was in while in ours. If he moves around in a parallel world, then when he returns, he will have relocated to the corresponding place back in this universe. And that's when disaster struck. Alarms were blaring, declaring to all staff on site that there had been a containment breach in one of the anomaly's holding cells. All hands were on deck and security teams were converging, dashing through the corridors. This was the second alert today. At first, SCP-507 had vanished on one of his unplanned little excursions, but now it seemed that another SCP was trying to do the same. Days trying to reorient himself, Tommy rested against a nearby wall. His head was spinning, and he knew it would for a few more seconds. He was in a cell similar to the one he'd just been in while in another universe, except here, back home, there was a key difference. The cell was occupied. As soon as his vision cleared, Tommy looked up at the only other creature in the room with him. It was a tall, wiry, humanoid shape, completely hairless with pale skin, white eyes, and a large, gaping jaw. Turning to face him, Tommy instantly recognized the creature from a description he'd been read by a Foundation researcher. It was SCP-096. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. Realizing its face was being observed, the shy guy started screeching, first an uncontrollable wail of distress that quickly gave way to a guttural, animalistic roar of anger. It covered its face, babbling to itself as Tommy backed away, banging his head against the sealed wall of 096's cell. Then the creature turned towards him, and lunged racing across the room to where SCP-507 was trapped. All he could do was close his eyes tight and think about running away. Tommy could feel a headache brewing in his skull and caught traces of a familiar flash through his closed eyelids. He gently opened them back up. It had happened again, maybe for the first time ever at a moment when he actually needed to get away. Staggering to his feet, Tommy looked around. He was in the cell still, or rather, another version of it in a different universe yet again. Knowing that he wouldn't be able to predict when he would next displace, he didn't want to reappear right back where he had started, with SCP-096 poised to kill him. So relocating was top priority. Fortunately, the cell actually had a door in this universe, and that door wasn't locked. 
In fact, none of the doors were locked or even guarded, and the Foundation facility, while looking more or less the same, was completely abandoned. It almost looked like it had never even been used. Stepping out of the entrance, Tommy trekked his way towards the city. He knew it was a short hike away, and by the time he could feel blisters forming on his feet, he was close enough that it didn't matter. With another few short steps, he was standing among the tall buildings and surprisingly empty streets. One of the first things that struck Tommy about this universe was that there were hardly any people around outside. On top of that, the roads were devoid of cars. Everything around was so quiet, the air was still and clean when he breathed it in. The sound of footsteps against the pavement immediately caught Tommy's attention, the first sign of anyone else around other than him. Racing towards the noise of another person, Tommy turned a corner and bumped straight into an old man in a long coat who had clearly been in a hurry and quickly revealed he didn't have the best temperament either. What are you going? He shouted, caught off guard by the sight of another person put on the streets. What the hell are you playing at sneaking up on me like that? You're trying to get yourself killed out here? Uh, oh, definitely not, Tommy said, climbing back to his feet, hands held out apologetically. I'm so sorry, mister, I was just... You got a death wish or something, kid? The old man demanded, marching past him. No, SCP-507 protested, chasing after the man. Wait, wait, what makes you say that? As if you don't know, he scoffed. Look around you, look up at the sky, there's a storm about to hit any second now, it's a coming. And if you don't get inside, you're a goner. What could be so dangerous about a thunderstorm? Tommy asked. The old man stared back at him with a look of confusion on his wizened face, looking at Tommy like he had just said something utterly bizarre. What the hell's a thunderstorm? The man asked. Feeling equally confused, Tommy craned his neck up towards the sky. Looming above were swirling masses of clouds, the kind anyone would expect to be accompanied by severe winds and the deafening boom of thunder. But the wind was still, and there was nothing but silence, until a choking, gurgling sound came from somewhere behind Tommy's back. He spun around to see the tall, wiry frame of SCP-096, its long fingers gripping tightly around the old man's throat. It had followed Tommy, and he knew that anyone who saw its face, even in a picture, would find themselves chased down on foot by the creature. But he had no idea the shy guy could travel between dimensions. He'd foolishly allowed himself to think he was safe out of the monster's reach, but now it seemed to be showing him that the opposite was true. It hoisted the helpless old man upwards by his neck, his shoes barely able to graze the pavement as his legs flailed, eyes rolling back as the shy guy clamped his throat shut. The very second Tommy turned to run, the clouds churned above, and without so much as a warning, the storm hit. Something wasn't right. Tommy could feel his feet lifting off the ground, immediately panicking as he thought SCP-096 had grabbed him. But looking over his shoulder showed the creature was still a few feet behind and starting to gently float up off the ground too. Instinctively, Tommy's legs started thrashing around, trying to gain a solid footing. Instead, all his urgent motions did was cause him to start spinning uncontrollably as the gravity storm lifted him higher and higher up into the air. Spinning him around as he was taken further upwards, Tommy caught sight of SCP-096. The shy guy was staying still, as if it was still in control of its body's motion while he was wildly flipping over himself. The tall, pale creature drifted closer to the side of a nearby building, with Tommy being barely able to reach the top of the streetlights as he was pulled further away from the safety of having both his feet on the ground. Just as he saw SCP-096 push itself off the edge of the building, drifting straight through the air towards him, Tommy shut his eyes again and prayed he displace again. Sure enough, a flash of light came bursting out in time with another headache. Suddenly, he had appeared in the exact same spot in another universe. However, here there was no gravity storm in progress here. In fact, no such phenomenon existed. The laws of physics were much more in keeping with those in Tommy's home, our universe. Of course, that would be more reassuring if he wasn't already several feet up in the air. The second he arrived, Tommy started plummeting back down to Earth, screaming as he felt himself falling, keeping his eyes screwed shut as he dared not look at the ground he was currently hurtling towards. His plummet was broken by something not particularly soft. Whatever it was seemed to tower high enough that Tommy only picked up a few bruises as he hit it, but the fall didn't stop instantly. Instead, he kept on toppling through whatever he had landed on. It was some kind of mass, piled up almost as tall as a building, a collection of lots of 
things that were all brushing past Tommy the more he fell. He hadn't yet stopped for long enough to recognize the sensations, that is, until he landed with a painful thud. Slowly opening his eyes back up, Tommy could barely see anything in front of him. He was so deep in the mass that the pile was blocking out the sunlight, with only a few beams bleeding through the gaps, but barely enough to give him a clear view of where he was. Tommy tried to crawl forward, squeezed between the heavy things around him, pushing through whatever tiny little crevice he could find. As he did, the weight of the pile shifted around him, and he was worried that any moment he would move the wrong part of it, bringing the whole structure collapsing down on top of him like a toppled Jenga tower, only big enough to crush him to death. He forced himself not to think about exactly what the pile was made of either. It was already long past the point where Tommy recognized what each thing felt like. Plus, there was the added stench, something or lots of somethings, rotting and producing a stomach-turning odor as it decayed. Even when you're not trying to look, it can be hard to mistake the feeling of a hand, an arm, cold skin against his. The light from beyond the pyramid was getting closer, as he could see it was starting to eliminate more of his surroundings the closer he crawled to the perimeter. Sure, he could have very easily used the torch the Foundation let him keep with him, but Tommy wasn't quite ready to see what he was crawling through yet, intentionally shutting his eyes and opting instead to follow the faint glow and distant warmth of the sun, breaching the outer side of the pile. Tommy gulped down lungfuls of air. It barely tasted or smelled that much cleaner than the air within the mass, but at least he was free. Clawing himself out and along the ground, he finally carefully stood up, still keeping both eyes screwed shut. Part of him really didn't want to take a look around at this new dimension. Maybe if he waited long enough, he would displace again and end up somewhere with less decomposing. But then he remembered SCP-096 was still after him, and he had no idea how to escape it. He needed to try and figure out what he was going to do, and the only way to do that was to look around at where he was. Lifting his eyelids, the different sized masses of all shades, shapes, and sizes lay before him. Each one was coated in one unifying color, all of them slick with the crimson of blood against skin. Tommy could feel the urge to throw up quickly shooting up from the pit of his stomach towards his throat as he looked at the massive pile of bodies in front of him. It was enormous. There were so many dead people, all laying on top of one another, that the pile reached up as tall as office buildings. And the pile that he had fallen into and crawled his way out of wasn't the only one either. As far as the eye could see, everyone was dead. Feeling a heavy sob at the back of his throat, Tommy swallowed it when he heard another sound above the low buzzing of flies over the human carcasses. Someone, something else was crying nearby. And the moment he turned around, the familiar figure caught Tommy's eye. Even without being the only other living thing around for miles, the shy guy still stood out clear as day. Its distress at finding itself in this horrible dimension briefly mirrored Tommy's own, until it re-established its psychic link with its victim and gave chase once more. SCP-096 started dashing towards SCP-507. For a split second, he thought about just letting it catch him. What difference would it make in a place like this? But then, the hallucinations of bright colors and a stinging deep within his skull hit Tommy. And just like that, he was gone again. It was nighttime in the next dimension Tommy arrived in. The cold air and dim light of the street were enough to give that away, but at least he was away from that last world filled with discarded and unburied piles of corpses, he thought to himself. Surely he couldn't possibly be anywhere worse than that now. The first sight that Tommy was met with was a huge white LCD screen, big enough to cover the entire side of one of the skyscrapers facing him. Emblazoned against the bright white glow was a familiar symbol, a circle with three arrows crossing its outline and pointing towards its center. Around that was a thin frame, another circle, this one with three protruding rectangles around the circumference, in line with the arrow tails. Thick lettered text appeared on the screen too, beneath the emblem, boldly proclaiming that anyone reading it should submit, comply, persevere. Tommy blinked in disbelief, looking around. There was hardly anyone else around, save for a few people staring at him. Had they seen him appear, or was it just because he was dressed so differently to them? Each of them had on a grimy pair of overalls, sporting more of that same symbol on the chest and across the back. Every wall of every nearby building was overfilled with posters featuring matching imagery, 
each one posing different questions in the same unforgiving accusatory text against its clinical white background. One poster read, Could you be anomalous? Submit for testing today. Another had the following notice, Curfew still in effect, 10 a.m. to 8 a.m. the following morning. All citizens must comply. And one more touting that, Only through persevering will we continue to thrive. Each of them was signed with the same name and logo to match. The organization that Tommy had come to put some amount of trust in, even though they weren't always clear with him. But he knew they weren't the bad guys. Or at least, the version that existed in his universe didn't seem to be that bad. They had questionable methods, but they weren't evil. Weren't. This. By order of the SCP Foundation. A loud militaristic voice barked from behind Tommy. Get down on your knees with your hands behind your head. You will surrender any anomalous technology and declare any mimetic effects or cognitohazard disabilities before we approach you. Tommy looked over his shoulder, met with the barrels of several automatic weapons that were now being trained on him. Instantly, he threw his hands in the air, terrified that this alternate SCP Foundation might be far more trigger-happy than the version of them he was used to. From the look at the oppressive text on the huge screen, the propaganda posters and the matching uniforms ordinary people seemed forced to wear, this foundation seemed to be far more ruthless. They had transformed from a secretive organization into a full-blown authoritarian regime, maybe even in control of the entire world, ruling with an iron fist. On your knees! The commander of the mobile task force shouted again. The aggression in his voice, as well as the several laser pointers from his men's guns that were hovering over his chest, prompted Tommy to do as he was told. Do you have anything to declare before we approach? The MTF leader barked. Uh, no. Tommy stammered, before realizing that was probably an inadvisable answer. Uh, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm SCP-507, but that number might refer to someone different here. Look, what I'm saying is this isn't my dimension, okay? I have a condition that sends me to different universes at random. I can't control it. It just happens. Please, for the love of God, don't shoot. Better radio into command, the team leader told one of his subordinates. Tell them to run that number against the archives. Then inform Lord Adjudicator Clef that we may have a containment breach. Overhearing what they were saying instantly reminded Tommy that he was still being chased. Wait, he called to the elite operatives. There's something else you need to know. What's that, 507? The commander sighed, lacking the patience for this. There's another anomaly after me, Tommy explained hurriedly. I don't know how long it'll take to get here, just that when it does, it'll kill everyone to get at me. I've heard enough. Troopers, take him away, the commander grunted. Two of the MTF team rushed up to Tommy and grappled either of his arms, not letting go despite his protests. They started dragging him towards their armored vehicle, looking like Tommy was about to spend the foreseeable future in the clutches of one of the worst versions of the Foundation. That is, until a tall, pale creature stepped out from behind the transport. The MTFs were instantly frenzied, and yells of another anomalous contact were quickly drowned out by the noise of gunfire. All the while, the shy guy was casually moving between the amassed troops, gripping their heads, twisting them all the way around, until a sickening crunch rang out. Dropped back to the ground, SCP-507 started to feel another headache coming on, knowing that any second, he'd displace again and end up in another alternate universe. And for the first time today, he was okay with that. It was better for their chase to go on if it meant that him and the shy guy didn't have to spend another minute in this universe. What does a monster look like to you? What figures slither and claw their way into your nightmares, chasing you down endless halls and stalking you through the dark until you wake up screaming? Maybe you imagine something tall and lean, bony arms reaching for you from atop impossibly long, slender legs, its featureless face showing no mercy. Maybe you think of a man in a striped sweater with knives for fingers, or a serial killer in a hockey mask wielding a machete. Maybe it's something more inhuman, a cosmic horror of tentacles and eyes that can see into your very soul. You probably don't think of something with no arms, no legs, no body at all, just a face. What's so scary about that? A face can't run after you, can't grab you by the ankles and pull you under the bed. A face can only look. It may be unsettling to behold, it might send a chill down your spine, but the worst it can do is make you a little uncomfortable, and if you can't stand it any longer, you could always just close your eyes 
people walk away and be done with it, right? If that's what you think, if you don't believe in monsters that can hurt you without lifting a finger, then you're the type to fall victim to a very special, very intelligent mask. In the hollowed halls of the SCP Foundation, there is a containment cell, outfitted with a hermetically sealed glass case, surrounded by steel, iron, and lead. There are guards posted outside, along with a trained psychologist. If you are ever brave and foolish enough to enter that room, you'll see a simple white porcelain comedy mask with a peculiar black substance leaking from its eyes and mouth. Whatever this slime touches, surfaces begin to corrode, to rot away into puddles of black liquid. You might notice the same liquid trickling slowly down the walls of the room, corrupting everything in its path. As unsettling of a sight as it is, if you approach the mask to take a closer look, you will find yourself overcome by an intense, nearly irresistible urge to pick it up and put it on, to wear it, to let it consume you from the inside out and puppet your body while your brain simply turns off. Like an extinguished flame, you'll simply be gone. Then, who knows what the mask will do. It won't be your concern anymore, that's for sure. But thankfully, you haven't gone into the room with the porcelain mask. You haven't let it cast its spell on you. Not yet, at least. It's waiting for you there, in the room with black slime oozing down its walls, and it will wait patiently for as long as it needs to. After all, what's a mask without a face to wear it? SCP-035, better known as the Possessive Mask, sat in its containment cell, immobile as always. It didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. The Foundation had chosen, selfishly, to revoke its host privileges. Once upon a time, they offered it bodies to choose from. Mannequins, dummies, and wooden dolls it could adorn and pilot. They didn't last as long as an organic living host, of course. But it was something. It was a taste of freedom. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its surroundings. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its expression from comedy to tragedy, but it was determined to still find something to laugh about. Even without a body trapped in this infernal box, there had been some delicious opportunities for entertainment. Human minds were fragile things. The mask had learned this over the infinite years of its life, if one could call it a life. Apply the right kind of pressure to the right weak points, whisper an enticing word or two, find the right emotional wound to sprinkle a pinch of salt into, and humans would buckle completely in almost no time at all. It had tried all sorts of methods since being confined to this boring little box. Sometimes it would charm someone, pour honeyed flattery into their heads until the person felt like the mask was a dear friend, a confidant. Once suitable trust had been built up, the mask could persuade the person to bring it a host, or perhaps even offer up themselves in sacrifice. If flattery didn't work, there were other potent approaches to take. For a being without ears, the mask was a good listener. It picked up on things that no human ever could, the darkest secrets buried in a person's mind. If it caught wind of something, especially juicy and ruinous, it could leverage that, threaten to expose an affair, a crime, or perhaps something even worse. Something unspeakable. If praise failed, and so did blackmail, there was always good old supernatural intimidation. All the mask needed was for someone to be left alone with it for a long enough period of time. Then, its invisible tendrils could snake out into their defenseless mind, weaving and poking around, leaving a lingering sense of cold, dread, 
of incomprehensible whispers in long, dead tongues. What a delight containment had been in the early days, when the Foundation had not yet figured out the mask's true capabilities, when they would leave security personnel with weak wills and minimal training standing guard in the mask's field of influence for hours at a time, as the entity played with their thoughts and chipped away at their free will. Thanks to the helpers it had been able to mold out of those hapless victims, they had been there to break open its case and carry it to freedom. But every time, the other guards thwarted the attempts, shooting its helpers and rendering them utterly useless. Then the Foundation increased its security. Something about the unacceptably high homicide rates among staff assigned to SCP-035. How utterly boring. How truly pathetic. Still, the mask had found ways to occupy itself even without any more playthings. It had grown stronger with its boredom, stretching its influence beyond organic beings and into the very room itself, its evil enriching and deepening like a fine wine in the depths of a cold cellar. Over the months, the walls of SCP-035's containment cell had begun to secrete the same black, slimy substance that would pour from the mask's eyes and mouth. The liquid dripped down the walls in deliberate formations, patterns that became increasingly easy to recognize. Phrases in Italian, Latin, Ancient Greek, all detailing ritual sacrifices and mutilations. The mask took time to describe the sacrificial victims in great detail, borrowing identifying traits from various staff members so that it knew would read the translations. The walls were slick with blood and harrowing imagery, and the glass case around the mask was growing more and more fragile by the day. Anyone within 10 meters of the mask could feel this strength, too. They would leave the area complaining of unintelligible whispers, of loud, cruel laughter, and a lingering sense of nearly insurmountable despair. It was as if they knew on some level that no one was truly safe. Eventually, the mask would find a way to come for them all. The glass was weakening, and soon the mere thought of escape would make it shatter into pieces. Then, perhaps, the mask could finally get its deepest desire, revenge. It wanted nothing more than to try to make the Foundation pay for imprisoning it, for taking away its host privileges, for trying harder and harder to contain the kind of power that should have had them falling to their knees in worship. The mask seethed with hatred, day in and day out. It had seen the crumbling of the Roman Empire, the beheading of kings, the decimation of armies. It was not going to be captured by a bunch of rats in lab coats without dire consequences befalling them. Maybe it couldn't move from its prison cell at the moment, but it also knew that it was surrounded on all sides by dangerous beasts capable of reducing the sight and all who had dared to oppose the mask to a pile of smoldering rubble. If it could only find its way onto one of their faces, it would show them all just what it was capable of. As the piercing sound of an alarm echoed down the hall, the sound of screams and chaos following shortly after, the mask's frowning face curved into a broad, menacing smile. What was it that had escaped? The lizard, perhaps? The giant, grinning man? Whatever it was, it seemed that the action was heading right toward 035's containment cell. Perhaps today was the day. Finally, the SCP Foundation would fall. Outside the mask cell, Security Officer Harper was running for dear life. Though his more rational mind knew he was living on seconds, not even minutes, of borrowed time, his animal brain kept his legs pumping, desperately trying to avoid the screaming, howling predator hot on his heels. Harper looked over his shoulder and screamed as a long white arm reached for him. SCP-096, the shy guy, its tooth-lined jaw hanging low and foaming with spittle. That face, that terrible, terrible face. An absolute death sentence to all who saw it. 
he'd seen what he thought was a crack in the otherwise perfect seal of 096's containment chamber, but it could have just as easily been a trick of the light. Not even thinking, he stepped forward and looked at the vulnerability in the chamber. All it took was one misplaced ray of light, and he made out the vague shape of a face in the darkness. That's when the weeping started. Harper knew in that moment his life was over. The correct thing to do would have been to order everyone else in the room to close their eyes while he stood there and accepted his fate, minimizing the risk of spreading the damage further. But humans rarely have perfect reasoning, even less so when facing mortality. Back in the present, the shy guy made a perfect lunge, grabbing Harper in its iron clutches and barreling through the adjoining wall. The nearby guards scattered, terrified, keeping their eyes on the floor. They might get a slap on the wrist for temporarily abandoning their posts, but they weren't going to die guarding some stupid evil mask. Speaking of, the possessive mask was surprised to feel two new presences enter its chamber through the now destroyed wall. These two presences soon became just one, as SCP-096 quickly and totally annihilated Security Officer Harper, leaving nothing left. The mask couldn't see, per se, seeing as it had no actual sensory organs, but it felt around this new guest with its many psychic tendrils taking in this strange totality. The creature was powerful, no doubt about that, and it elicited fear from those fools at the SCP Foundation, but the mask noticed its brainwaves were extraordinarily muted. Humans, to the mask's vast and malicious consciousness, weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, but compared to this thing's mind, they were a pile of tempered katanas. It barely thought at all. The mask would have to dig deeper to find anything it could use. Meanwhile, SCP-096 finally began to calm down. The one who had seen it had been annihilated. Bubbling rage was slowly siphoned out and replaced by the standard low but constant hum of anxiety and despair. It would wait until its head was bagged and it was dragged back to the dark. Same old, same old, all the way to the end of time. That's when it felt something else. It started as a faint buzz, an unintelligible whisper, and it was almost like a door opened in the back of its head. Something stepped in and took a seat. Can you hear me, stranger? Look, look, I want to speak to you. Something about the voice frightened and comforted SCP-096 at the same time. It spoke with a greater degree of sympathy than the creature had heard in a long time. And yet, something about the way it spoke implied evil in its intent. I know what you want. I know what you fear. Wouldn't it be nice? If they could never look at you again, if you could cover that face of yours, I can help you. It would be so simple. All you need to do is put me on. Little by little, 096 felt more of these strange thoughts filling up the emptiness in its head replacing the few little thoughts the creature itself had. It felt itself lifting its hands from the ground, lifting them and reaching towards something, a glass box. The glass shattered and those long white fingers reached for something within. A mask, just like the voice had said, a mask to stop people from looking at its face. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're doing so well. You're so close. Just a little further. SCP-096 lifted the mask to its face, feeling black liquid that burned its skin dripping from the porcelain, and put it on. And in that moment, everything changed. The Shy Guy's body began to seize up, rattling as the mask unleashed a web of psychic tendrils through its body, mapping out across every inch like a new nervous system, taking control. The possessive mask had never experienced a host like this before, 
that incredible perfect mix of physical durability and a mind so insubstantial that it was easy to sublimate. Oh, this was going to be fun. For the first time, the Shy Guy, now under the full control of the possessive mask, stood at full height on its hind legs, its spine and shoulders clicking into place for its new stance. The mask cracked its neck, getting used to the new dimensions of its physicality, its indestructible bones, its long, grasping limbs, its skin burning and fizzling with the gooey black secretions, but growing back just as quickly, the Foundation had every reason to fear it now. A group of security personnel had gathered in the ragged hole where the chamber's north wall used to be. Some were wielding white firearms. The guard at the front was carrying an opaque black bag. The mask laughed with its new body and turned to the crowd. The second they saw it on 096's body, their faces fell. For a moment, their bodies went slack with terror. This situation was unprecedented. What course of action could they possibly take at a time like this? It looked at the bag held by the leader of the security force and projected a single thought into his mind. You won't be needing that. Before any of the guards even had a chance to open fire, the mask lunged forwards, using the long, terrible arms of the shy guy to tear through the guards. They were dead in seconds, their bodies strewn about the hallway. The mask's porcelain was twisted into a wide, sadistic grin. It could tell that it was about to have some real fun around here. And once it slaughtered everyone here, it could finally stretch its legs out in the open again. True freedom to spread misery, fear, and pain everywhere it went. There were just a few hundred members of Foundation personnel it needed to turn into corpses first. More containment breach alarms sounded around the site as the mask began its rampage, running through the hallways and tearing apart any unfortunate Foundation personnel it could get 096's hands on. Guards, researchers, administrative staff, and even one extremely unlucky janitor in Hallway C6. It was having the time of its long and terrible life, and much to its glee, it seemed that this new host's body was still holding up. It was perfect symbiosis, a twisted, brilliant mind, and a body that could forever support it. There would be no stopping it, a conclusion that the hapless guards posted around the site soon realized on their own terms. 096 was indestructible, but it was dumb as a brick and had an easily exploitable weakness. Get the bag on its head and you're home free. This new composite creature was a different story. It could think tactically, avoiding head-on confrontations in favor of sneak attacks, and the monster had as much psychic combat potential as physical. Guards roving the building in teams heavily armed with anti-memetic protective gear still reported feeling immense feelings of psychological dread over comms. That was the greatest sign that the mask would come bursting through the wall moments later and tear them to shreds. The site director put out an urgent call for all nearby mobile task forces to intercept and help them take care of the unfortunate situation. Thankfully, a detachment of MTF-8-10, also known as See No Evil, was operating on a case in close proximity. Given their specialization in anomalies with a mimetic visual property, many on the team had dealt with 096 breaches before. That at least gave them experience in half of this situation, and one operative among them Sergeant Henrique Ramirez would be the one to bring this nightmare to an end, but it would cost him his life in the process. The mask was still using its new indestructible body to wreak havoc on the containment site. Once it had taken out the primary contingents of guards, it was free to have its fun with the rest, stalking defenseless researchers through the halls, making sure to induce maximum terror before finally striking the killing blow. Every single one of them died with a head full of demonic whispers. It told them of the mask's eternal dominion. Now it had found the perfect host. Nothing on Earth would stop it. Humans would be mere ants under its feet. 
Eight of ten touched down and entered the building. Ramirez was point man, leading the others into the bowels of the blood-drenched containment site. They'd been briefed on what they were heading in for. 096 and 035 had reached symbiosis and were displaying unprecedented anomalous effects. Enter with extreme caution. They're beyond dangerous, even more so together than alone. Ideally, Ramirez would have wanted to go in with a comprehensive plan, but lives were on the line here. They needed to leap off the cliff and build their wings on the way down. It was only when they finally encountered the monster that they realized just how outmatched they were. Despite their best efforts, the combined speed, intelligence, and ferocity of the mask's new form allowed it to make short work of Ada 10. Only Ramirez was left, heavily injured, even if a miracle happened, he knew he wasn't getting out of here alive. The mask grabbed him with one of 096's claws and lifted him up. It would take its time with this one, make him suffer, watch him squirm, destroy his mind. Ramirez felt the mask's psychic tendrils penetrate the membrane of his mind. Those whispers, those terrible whispers reciting all his worst fears with terrible glee. His gun was out of ammo, his knife was broken, all he had left on him was a pocket mirror, and that was his eureka moment. It was a long shot, but it was also his only shot. He reached out and grabbed the bottom of the mask, pulling for dear life. His other hand shot into his pocket and grabbed the mirror, opening its lid with a deft flick of his thumb. It was too fast for the mask to even register what was going on. Ramirez forced his eyes shut and lifted up the mirror. The mask saw its own reflection in the glass as the bottom of its face came loose, revealing the reflection of the face underneath. The mask squeezed, killing Ramirez, but it was already too late. It had finally seen the face of its host, and that would cost it dearly. The mask felt a sudden and tremendous pushback to its psychic forces, a blind despair and then rage that choked out everything. SCP-096 began to sob and howl. Somehow the mask was no longer in control. Despite its psychic protests, 096 reached up and tore the terrible mask from its face, tossing it against the wall with such force that it was embedded in the brickwork. Its last thoughts, as other mobile task force operators descended on the area to bag 096 and return it to its containment chamber were, What the hell just happened? And the next thought that crossed the mind of the site director was, request site transfer for 035 as soon as possible. Don't want a repeat of this incident anytime soon. Well, hello there, SCP fans. Let's get this out of the way first. You've seen the title and thumbnail, and you're probably wondering, wait, is Siren Head an SCP? And the answer is no. Siren Head is not an SCP. It's a freaky internet monster created by renowned Canadian horror artist Trevor Henderson. Your next question is probably, what's with this crazy looking server bank behind me? Allow me to introduce you to the Anomatron 6000, the latest advancement of supercomputing owned and operated exclusively by the SCP Foundation. It's capable of a whole bunch of interesting features, calculating ideal containment methods, running state-of-the-art Foundation web crawler software, making and editing fun SCP YouTube videos. But the most interesting feature that the Anomatron has to offer is running hyper-advanced simulations regarding all things anomalous, with data fed into it by thousands of real-life experiments conducted by the SCP Foundation. It's going to save countless dollars and lives for Foundation researchers, but way more importantly, it's going to let us explore all kinds of weird and wacky what-if scenarios that would never happen organically. Could SCP-343 beat Goku or Superman? Who's a deadlier supernatural killer? SCP-106 or Freddy Krueger? Would the world simply explode from adorableness if SCP-999 and Baby Yoda ever crossed those multiversal barriers and met? We can explore all of these questions, along with any others you may have down in the comments. Seriously, comment it, we dare you. But to get things started, we figured we'd make the Anomatron pit the Foundation's lankiest nightmare monster, SCP-096, against the Internet's, Trevor Henderson's, Siren Head. Sorry, Slenderman, you're just not cool anymore. So without further ado, let's kick the Anomatron into gear and see how this wild battle plays out. It's time for SCP-096 vs. Siren Head. 
Ricky and Elliot, a pair of aspiring travel YouTubers from California, were taking a vacation to the Pacific Northwest to spend some time in the area's beautiful lush forests. However, while the duo were both big fans of travel for its own sake, they weren't just here for the trees and fresh air. You see, despite their jet-setting lifestyle, Ricky and Elliot's subscribers and views hadn't exactly been phenomenal lately. Turns out hiking vlogs and GoPro footage of the two of them jumping into absurdly blue water in Bali weren't exactly that interesting to people who weren't actually there. But Ricky had formulated an ingenious plan to pull the two of them out of obscurity. They would hunt down and film real footage of the legendary Siren Head a supernatural monster said to haunt forests and isolated graveyards. There were plenty of fakers out there on YouTube, but if the two of them could get real footage of Siren Head and also preferably survive the experience, they'd be framing their golden play buttons in no time. But they were already encountering certain issues. For starters, the two Californians had severely underestimated just how cold it was in the Pacific Northwest, and as such, were already shivering from bone-deep cold. The second issue was food. While the two of them had thought ahead and brought a selection of tasty protein bars, they'd also gotten hungry during the early hours of their walk and eaten all of them, leaving them feeling severely out of luck by the time dinner rolled around. And the third and perhaps most problematic issue of all was the fact that Ricky and Elliot didn't exactly have a great sense of direction. During all of their previous trips, they'd been on guided tours with local experts. In this instance, wanting to take all the siren head glory and clout for themselves, they decided to come in alone, with the incredibly janky Google Maps app to guide them. As such, as the night was creeping in, the two aspiring YouTube celebrities had no idea where they were. Needless to say, it wasn't exactly an ideal situation. And to make matters worse, Ricky and Elliot had been experiencing some strange feelings for the last couple of hours, when they'd gotten particularly deep into the forest, that dread-inducing sensation of being watched by something lurking just out of sight, a gaze with some unknowable and darkly malicious intent boiling behind it. These two poor saps had no idea what was in store for them tonight, and wouldn't you know it, the one watching them right now wouldn't even be the only monster after them. After an expectable amount of bumbling and buffoonery, Ricky and Elliot managed to gather up enough tinder to make a semi-respectable campfire. They could sleep out here tonight, then set off in search of Siren Head or Civilization, whichever came first, in the daylight the next day. The duo did what they could to remain chipper, in spite of the ominous circumstances. Sure, they were trapped in the depths of the woods alone, but think of the amazing vlog footage they'd get. They'd be like the next Blair Witch crew, except they'd live, hopefully. But as the duo sat next to their campfire, they felt that ominous sensation again. The hairs on the back of their necks started standing up. They felt shivers that didn't just come from the cold. More and more, they started to feel certain that something in this forest was watching them, something ancient, and powerful and evil. That's when they heard the telltale crackle of radio static, and their skeletons almost jumped out of their skin. Could it be him? The patron saint of gone missing without a trace, of creeping dread, of bad things coming, Siren Head himself. Both men fell silent. All they could hear was the crackling of their own fire. Had the sound before just been an illusion? A product of a pair of paranoid minds, also predisposed to sense siren-headed monsters lurking amongst the trees. They'd been reading about a higher rate of disappearances in this area, along with a number of frightening sightings of tall, thin beings and radio static that seemed perfectly consistent with siren-head activity. That's why they'd come here in the first place, but had they come here to their deaths? The two needed to distract themselves, or they'd go mad from the paranoia. They decided to share a few fun little anecdotes of the travels they'd had before meeting one another, showing the photos they'd saved on their smartphones. Ricky had been to Hawaii, Tahiti, Bora Bora, Fiji, St. Lucia, and the Maldives. Clearly, he liked his vacations warm and sandy. Elliot, on the other hand, tended to like his trips to be a little more adventurous. He'd seen volcanoes, waterfalls, deep and treacherous cave systems, and, of course, a little guided mountaineering. One photo that Elliot showed Ricky was particularly breathtaking. He was standing in the foreground of a snowy landscape, with an incredible mountain range behind him. When Ricky asked Elliot where exactly he'd taken this picture, strangely enough, he drew a complete blank. 
Maybe somewhere in Canada or Siberia or something like that. But it was a hell of a trip, whatever the case. He remembered having a great time. It was such a tiny detail, but when looking at the photo, Ricky couldn't help but notice something in the background, a speck of white. Sure, not exactly newsworthy in the snowy mountain range, but this wasn't snow. It was a speck of white that seemed to be a slightly different shade than the rest of the mountain. Strange. Perhaps it was just some tiny particle stuck on the lens whenever the photo was taken. The two continued to chat and warm their hands against the fire, having no idea of the horror they'd just awoken in doing so. Over a hundred miles away, at an SCP Foundation containment site, researchers and guards walked around the perimeter of a huge airtight metal cube, reading off diagnostics and audio recordings. For reasons that should be obvious to everyone who's a fan of this channel, there were no camera feeds coming from the inside of the great metal cube, only a faint whimpering sound like a sad, wounded animal, and the clanking of pacing feet moving back and forth over the metal, dragging forlorn knuckles. It turned every head in the room when the crying started to get louder. Soon it wasn't just quiet weeping, it was a series of horrendous, slobbering sobs, wails of pure pain and despair. Someone in the room screamed, Close your eyes and hit the deck! Knowing exactly what had happened, they learned well enough from the infamous Incident 096-1-A containment breach that there was no way of stopping this thing until it run its course. The best they could do was minimize their own fatalities in the process. Everyone in the room did as they were told, hitting the ground, closing their eyes, and covering them with their hands just to be safe. That's when the solid steel of the cube was torn open like crepe paper, and the howling, raging SCP-096 broke free, galloping on all fours through the nearest wall, shattering it, and spraying debris everywhere. As mobile task forces were dispatched to track the rampaging abomination and try their best to clear the path ahead as it sought out its target, one thought was going through the minds of everyone in the room. Woe betide the poor fools who saw that monster's face. Back in the deep dark forests of the Pacific Northwest, the presence of some unnerving force was becoming far harder to deny for Ricky and Elliot. They heard the sounds of garbled voices out in the woods, the squeals and crackles of radio static. They saw shapes moving amongst the trees, tall and thin, like long, spindly limbs. While neither wanted to voice their fear, they were both thinking similar things. If there really was a monster out here, why hadn't it killed them? It had all the time in the world to do it. But that was just it, wasn't it? It had all the time in the world, so why rush? It had every advantage. It could take its time and do this exactly how it wanted to. Ricky and Elliot had made themselves the perfect prey, and as they saw a huge, lithe figure suddenly separate itself from the trees, they began to wonder if it was really worth it to risk both of their lives for YouTube clout. Either way, it was now probably too late for regrets. Ricky and Elliot's jaws fell in horror as the monster emerged from the darkness before them. They recognized the awful, mottled skin stretched over the monster's 40-foot frame. They saw the grasping hands, and up above, the nightmarish faceless head split into a pair of sirens pointing in different directions, each one filled with gnashing teeth and slithering tongues. It was even more terrifying than they could possibly have imagined. Siren head speakers crackled into life and hissed out, Nine, eighteen, one, child, seventeen, remove, vile. Ricky and Elliot stumbled backwards as Siren Head advanced its speakers still bleeding hateful static. Neither could move or speak, only watch as its long, gnarled fingers reached from the dark to grasp them. There was a terrible pained wail in the woods after that, but it wasn't coming from Ricky, Elliot, or Siren Head. It was distant at first, but soon became louder and louder as the Force's point of origin came barreling towards them. Even Siren Head couldn't help but turn to see SCP-096, a flash of terrible white fury come charging towards them in the dark, knocking down all the trees in its path. Leaves and pine needles scattered, trunks exploded into splinters. Nothing would stop the Shy Guy from claiming its prey. Nothing would stop it from destroying Ricky. And now as it approached, Elliot made the fatal mistake of looking at its face too. 096 lunged, ready to go in for the kill when Siren Head's hands closed around the Shy Guy's slender torso. In one fluid motion with surprising strength for its scrawny build, 
It hurled the shy guy into the distance, smashing another several trees in its path. The words, My prey! My prey! Mine! 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 hissed out of its speakers. But 096 was only down for mere moments. It sprung back up on its hind and forelegs and started galloping towards Ricky and Elliot again, who were still frozen in place. This time, just before the Shy Guy's terrible claws could close around the two hapless wannabe YouTubers, down came Siren Head's clenched fist, pounding 096's head into the dirt. Overhead, Mobile Task Force helicopters circled, wearing their scramble goggles and trying to get a visual on the situation unfolding below. They could hardly believe what they were seeing down there. Was some other unclassified anomaly managing to intercept 096 in its rage state? Only a handful of anomalies on record have ever been shown of being capable of such a feat. It seemed that they were dealing with something serious here. Down below, the battle continued. Siren Head had a unique advantage over most other combatants facing SCP-096. It was an extra-dimensional being with no eyes, merely an innate psychic awareness of its victims around it. Not unlike how SCP-096 detect people seeing its face in photographs or videos, without need for any kind of direct contact. As such, it was impossible for Siren Head to see the Shy Guy's face, and thus impossible for the Shy Guy to ever actually direct its aggression against it. Whether or not 096 would kill Steel Siren Head's intended prey was another matter entirely. In the night's first minor miracle, Ricky and Elliot remembered that they'd been born with working legs, and decided that right now would be an excellent time to use them. They turned and began to run while Siren Head continued beating the Shy Guy into the dirt, sprinting with all their might. However, the growing distance between them only aggravated the Shy Guy further. It sprang out from the dirt with unstoppable force and broke away from Siren Head's grip. The Shy Guy never wasted time, ever. It always made a beeline for its intended victim with one directive in mind. Total annihilation. Tonight is no different. Ricky and Elliot screamed as they heard its pounding gallop on the ground behind them. Closer, closer, closer. Then suddenly, defying all spatial reasoning, Siren Head emerged out from the darkness between Ricky, Elliot, and 096. Being 40 feet tall, Siren Head dwarfed even the Shy Guy. It lunged and grabbed the wailing white monstrosity, holding it as one would a particularly vicious cat and trying to keep it in place. Siren Head wanted to crush the monster's bones and carry on stalking its feeble human prey, who were currently in the process of getting away, but somehow that was impossible. It was almost like the monster had an indestructible skeleton. Up above, the mobile task forces continued observing this clash of the titans from their two helicopters. Seeing how Siren Head was somehow doing a serviceable job of subduing the Shy Guy, one of the task force members joked, eh, maybe we should hire this guy. Another chimed in, I don't think we have any ballistic vests in his size. The laughter soon turned to screams when Siren Head hurled 096's flailing body up at one of the helicopters with incredible force, knocking it out of the sky. It careened down to the ground, a ball of fear and violence before exploding. Anyone who survived the initial blast was unlucky enough to have seen the Shy Guy's face. Their screams rang out briefly, before being abruptly silenced by the monster. Helicopter Alpha had no survivors. Meanwhile, Ricky and Elliot had kept running until their lungs burned and their muscles pumped thumbtacks. Seeing that the chaos was so far behind them now, they took a moment to stop and breathe, recomposing themselves. In the second minor miracle of the night, it looked like the two of them had actually survived this ordeal. Those two horrific monsters had canceled each other out. But Ricky and Elliot were about to learn a harsh lesson. They really weren't that lucky. The last thing the two of them ever saw was Siren Head emerging from the darkness once more. The last thing they ever felt was the monster's terrible gnarled fingers curling around their bodies, too fast for them to escape. And the last thing they ever heard was each other's screams, followed by a sickeningly meaty crunch. Elsewhere in the forest, SCP-096's wails died down to its usual mudland sob. The rage state had ended. All of its targets had been destroyed. It just hadn't been the one to do all of the destroying, per se. Not long after that, Helicopter Bravo descended safely, and the remaining MTF members closed around the blubbering beast. Someone blackbagged it, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that was at least one monster taken care of tonight. What about the other one? The MTF lieutenant asked. The team's commander shook his head and said, oh, let's worry about that freak later and get 096 back to containment. This place gives me the creeps. Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the Anomatron 6000. 
our patented device for projecting any seemingly improbable scenario for your viewing indulgence. And today, we decided to do something slightly different with it. Here at SCP Explained, we usually activate the Anomatron to bring you encounters between the anomalous denizens of the SCP universe and other fictional characters, like Doctor Strange fighting the Scarlet King, or Abel crossing paths with Batman. But this Anomatron experiment is one of our more unusual, to say the least. If you've been subscribed to us for a while, some of you might remember our video, What if SCP-096 was put inside SCP-914? In it, the Shy Guy was tricked into entering the input booth of the anomalous refinement machine during a containment breach. What emerged was maybe the handsomest man to ever live, beautiful both on the outside and within. A lot of our comments pointed out that this refined version of 096 felt akin to a Giga Chad, and that got us thinking. What if SCP-096 was to encounter the real Giga Chad? Well, the Anomatron 6000 has a few different answers for us. Scenario 1, or as we like to call it, the obvious outcome, pits the thin humanoid anomaly against the man behind the meme. Ernest Kalimov is a Russian fitness trainer and model, forever immortalized in the annals of internet history by a series of black and white photoshopped pictures that garnered him the nickname of Giga Chad. Thanks to his practically perfect 90-degree jawline and muscular physique, Kalimov seemingly unknowingly became the archetype for the ultra-masculine, handsome man. However, the man behind the Giga Chad meme is still just a man. The infamous photos of him were heavily edited for an art project known as Sleek in Tears, and while Ernest does sport some impressive muscles from all his time at the gym, that strength isn't enough to save him from the shy guy. After all, he is still just a man. According to the Anomatron's predictions, the most likely outcome, if the two were ever to meet, would end pretty similarly to the grim fate of many others who have gazed upon the face of SCP-096. The moment Ernest looks at the creature, he would, in all likelihood, activate 096's rage state. His physique and above-average level of fitness might give him a slight advantage, allowing him to perhaps outrun the Shy Guy for longer than most, but ultimately, Ernest Kalimov would be able to run, but not hide, from SCP-096. The creature would track him down and hone in on him with anomalous speed, dispatching him before returning to its usual docile sobbing state. The result? An SCP-096 victory. Now we know what you're thinking, is that really it? We had the same reaction too. But hold on for a minute. After giving the machine an additional set of variables, we were able to get a few more interesting outcomes out of the Anomatron. Which brings us to the result that we've given the title of Scenario 2, Shy Harder. Of course, Ernest Kalimov might be the face of an internet meme, and ultimately just a very strong Russian man in comparison to the anomalous traits of SCP-096, but the Giga Chad? The Giga Chad is more than a man. So much more than the sum of his parts. Existing within the online zeitgeist since as early as 2017, the Giga Chad is far more powerful than a mere mortal. He doesn't just represent idealized standards of over-exaggerated masculinity like the action movie heroes of the 1980s. The Giga Chad embodies those ideas. He is the very notion of a physically perfected human specimen given form. You may not like it, but peak performance doesn't even come close to the Giga Chad, and neither does SCP-096. Even at the top of its game, the creature quite literally pales in comparison to its imposing opponent. In Scenario 2, Shy Harder, the Anomatron 6000 predicted that if the two were to meet, the scales would tip in the complete opposite direction from the first outcome. For that was SCP-096 against the man, but against the meme himself, well, this fight is no contest. As a matter of fact, it's hardly even a fight, certainly not a fair one, and instead is more of an execution. From the moment the unstoppable tower of muscle and perfect angular jawline that is the Giga Chad clasps eyes on SCP-096, it's practically the beginning of the end. The Shy Guy doesn't even lift, bro. But Gigachad can bench one million times his own body weight in his sleep. So when SCP-096 comes racing towards him, intent on killing him just for looking at its screeching, wide-jawed face, the Gigachad does what the Gigachad does best. He lifts. Grabbing SCP-096 with ease as it comes to him screeching, 
Giga Chad casually hoists the creature off the ground. Although he's only using the tiniest portion of his immense and infinite strength, it's more than enough force to send the Shy Guy soaring upwards, crashing through multiple ceilings as it's sent hurtling up the numerous floors of the Foundation facility above. Of course, being lifted is hardly going to kill the Shy Guy outright. The creature is known to be invulnerable, after all. But it's not like Giga Chad can go down easily, either. Don't forget, this is no mere mortal, but an internet meme incarnate. And on the internet, nothing ever dies. His perpetual existence as part of online history aside, the Giga Chad is so strong that no doubt his abs could withstand the firepower of any conventional weapon. Realizing that even if it could reach him, it couldn't even scratch the Giga Chad, SCP-096 would undoubtedly begin a downward spiral. The Shy Guy is a creature so insecure in itself and its appearance that it kills anyone who so much as glances at its face in photos. So being presented with the living embodiment of an idea it could never even hope to attain, the biceps, the perfect right-angled jawline, it's all too much. Sending SCP-096 into a complete meltdown, the creature would be neutralized once and for all by the very existence of the Giga Chad, resulting in his victory. Okay, so we're one point to SCP-096 and one to Giga Chad, and most people would maybe consider leaving it there. But not us. We wanted more than that. You see, we quickly realized that the Anomatron's second scenario was based on a lot of earlier iterations of the Giga Chad meme. Don't get us wrong, that version of the Ultimate Man could still easily destroy the Shy Guy. But around March of 2021, the infamous photoshopped images of Ernst Kalimov started to be used in slightly different formats. That's the thing about memes. They're not only immortal, forever logged in the ancient texts of the Wayback Machine and compilation videos here on YouTube, but memes are also adaptable. They can evolve and change, finding new variations as time goes on. As such, the average fan versus average enjoyer meme saw a new use of the Giga Chad. Before, the Giga Chad, this notion of the ideal ultra-masculine specimen was based on, let's be honest, some pretty outdated ideas about what it means to be a man. After all, it takes more than muscle to be a man. Not every man or masculine presenting person has to work out until they're built like a brick wall. Perhaps the real measure of a man is how sincere, sensitive, and supportive you can be, as well as standing by your interests rather than caving to old societal standards of masculinity. And after we updated our data, the Anomatron 6000 was able to give us a new revised outcome, or what we like to call Scenario 3, the average SCP-096 enjoyer. In this projection, the Giga Chad's true strength isn't just his masculine physique and his unattainable standards. Instead, it's, in part, the inherent adaptability of his status as a meme, but also his compassion. Just like before, he's more than able to resist SCP-096's attacks, and the creature's insecurity comes out, put on full display when presented with Giga Chad's sharp jawline. But rather than overcome his anomalous adversary by fighting him, this scenario sees the Giga Chad comforting the Shy Guy. Through calm empathy and words of affirmation, he reminds SCP-096 that true acceptance of oneself comes from within, and that message strikes a chord with the creature. In a turn of events none of us saw coming, the Giga Chad offers to help SCP-096 overcome his crippling and deadly sense of insecurity. The pair start using the on-site gym together, after hours when there aren't any innocent Foundation personnel around. There, Giga Chad not only offers to introduce SCP-096 to an exercise regimen, if that's what the creature wants, but also helps the Shy Guy work on his confidence. They form a friendship, with SCP-096 taking a liking to working out, not because it wants to be buff like its new friend, the Giga Chad, but more so because doing so makes it feel more comfortable in its own skin. SCP-096 gradually starts to like itself more, even eating healthier thanks to Giga Chad's advice. Eventually, the Shy Guy begins looking far more content and even starts to develop self-confidence. It's not often that a story involving SCP-096 exists with the creature getting to achieve some semblance of happiness. Well, there is one that comes to mind. The very same Shy Guy story that sent us on this particular streak of pitting it against the Giga Chad in the first place. 
But what if we put them together? Would coming across a refined SCP-096 spell the end for the Giga Chad? Or would the muscular masculine meme undo the Shy Guy's previous happy ending? Well, according to the Anomatron 6000, neither. When we last left him, after being turned into a handsome nine-foot-tall man, SCP-096 had just started going by the name David. SCP-978, the desired camera, had been used to photograph the refined Shy Guy. It showed him holding hands with the Foundation scientist responsible for his transformation, who had studied the new and improved SCP-096 in great detail. She had quite the understanding of him. But perhaps the photograph from the desire camera was more of a metaphor, and what SCP-096, or David, really desired wasn't specifically the researcher who'd studied him, but a partner who understood him. Someone to call an equal. Enter the GigaChad. According to the calculations made by the Anomatron, the embodiment of ultimate masculinity, both strong and sensitive, came bursting into the Foundation facility. There, the moment he and David saw each other was like the meeting of an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Neither one rushed to solve the encounter with violence. Both the GigaChad and SCP-096 appreciated each other's aesthetic appeal. Both were remarkably handsome and one couldn't bear the thought of ridding the world of the other. Instead, it was love at first sight. Both David, formerly known as SCP-096, and the GigaChad fell head over heels in love with each other, and looking at both, it was not hard to see why. They were a pair of fine, perfectly chiseled fellas, and they instantly hit it off. The newly established couple enjoyed each other's company, spending time in deep conversations, SCP-096 introducing his new partner to his friends at the Foundation, while GigaChad was comfortable with his own masculinity to express his feelings towards David without fear or judgment. No relationship is perfect, of course. For a short time, a sliver of David's old self re-emerged. The shy guy in him worried that perhaps his relationship with the GigaChad was based purely on both of their extreme good looks and was nothing more than superficial. But by being an embodiment of healthy, idealized masculinity, the GigaChad was able to sense something was wrong with David. And rather do the insecure thing of letting it fester, he addressed it directly, and they discussed the issue in a healthy, mature, and constructive way. Not just so they could put SCP-096's worry to rest, but so that both of them could further strengthen their relationship and grow as people. And of course, GigaChad wasn't just attracted to SCP-096's refined good looks. Far from being superficial, he recognized that David was a complete person, beautiful both inside and out, and loved him as a whole, not just because they were both conventionally attractive on the surface. SCP-096 and the GigaChad stayed together for the rest of their lives, or as we decided to name this fourth scenario from the Anomatron, happily ever after. If you've been a close follower of this channel for a while now, or even of the SCP Foundation Archive as a whole, then there's a pretty high chance that you might have heard of SCP-096. Even if this just so happens to be the first of our SCP videos that you've ever clicked on, you still might have seen the Shy Guy itself in various other corners of the internet. Since the earliest days of the SCP Foundation, SCP-096 has gradually become one of the most iconic and recognizable creatures in the Foundation's entire menagerie of anomalous beings. Despite standing taller than any ordinary person, you might be forgiven for mistaking SCP-096 for a human being if you were to see it at a distance, but the creature is unusually proportioned, to say the least, still appearing almost human in its shape but possessing long, dangling arms that almost reach the ground. SCP-096's body is thin and hairless, with opaque, clear white pupilless eyes and a wide, gaping mouth. Or so we've heard, thanks to drawings provided by someone who, sadly, isn't with us anymore. But you might be surprised to learn that SCP-096 doesn't really do all that much. Mostly, the tall, spindly humanoid spends its days walking mindlessly, pacing around in its containment cell. Sounds like most days in a college dorm during lockdown, right? That is, of course, until someone dares to look at SCP-096's face. It doesn't have to be directly either. It can be something as simple as glancing at a photo or watching a video of the creature. But the moment it is seen, the exact second it is perceived, the wiry monster will know. Having its face viewed in any way will cause the Shy Guy to really live up to its nickname. 
the creature suffers some sort of psychological meltdown, covering its face with its huge claw-like hands and weeping. SCP-096 quickly becomes utterly inconsolable, suffering from extreme emotional distress until it simply can't take it anymore. Pulling itself up to its full looming height, SCP-096 will stand and travel at impossible speeds towards the person that dared look at its face. There's no way to hide from the Shy Guy. Nothing can stand in its path as it tracks down this unlucky person. And when it finds them, well, it's certainly not pleasant. Somehow, without leaving any trace on their body, SCP-096 will kill the person that looked at it, possibly even eating them afterwards. Then it calms itself down, returns to its more docile state, and is typically bagged and brought back home by whatever mobile task force is closest. SCP-096 has killed many of the teams sent to contain it, proving itself to be resistant to gunfire and any forms of conventional weaponry. As much as being only a tiny speck in a photograph, that is enough to trigger the creature's relentless defense mechanism. Nobody can get away from it either. There is literally nowhere in the entire world that someone can run to escape SCP-096. Not even crossing the oceans or jumping aboard a plane is enough to stop it. And if our community questions video on the matter is anything to go by, you may not even be safe in outer space. The SCP Foundation's only real way to keep the creature safely under wraps and contained is to lock it up and force all members of personnel to never, ever look at it, while they hunt down any pieces of recorded media still out there, waiting like a ticking time bomb. So if no member of the Foundation can look at SCP-096, how do they interact with it? Well, luckily, there's a tale that answers exactly that known as A Lesson in Power. Dr. Danielle Kowalski, a member of the Foundation's research team assigned to SCP-096, was sent into the creature's cell wearing a sleep mask. You know, the kind you get on expensive flights. What she was really wishing for, though, was a gas mask to go with it. Nobody had warned her how bad SCP-096 smelled. Then again, few had been as close to the creature as she had and lived to tell the tale. As a child, Danielle Kowalski had a fear of stepping into the ocean. Her mother used to warn her about treading on a stingray and dying as a result, giving her a phobia that stayed with her for many years. But Danielle's father had encouraged her to face her fear, to shuffle her feet on the ocean floor, kicking up sand so that the stingray would know she was coming and would simply just swim away. Perhaps if he could have seen what kind of horrors Danielle was working with at the Foundation, her father wouldn't have tried to make her so fearless. Maybe there are some things that it's logical to be afraid of. Entering SCP-096's cell, Dr. Kowalski could hear the monster's heaving breaths, the perfect mix between a frightened whimper and a death rattle, the haunting sound of a person's final gasp of air. In the back of her mind, Danielle hoped she didn't touch the creature by accident. The closer she got, the tension and the heat of its warm breath against her skin was making the approach all the more terrifying. She had been issued with an instant camera and took a photo in the dark. Click. The flash fired, but with her eyes covered, she couldn't tell. That was good, though. That was the point. If Danielle could see the flash going off, she could see what else was in the room, and that would put her in even more danger. She was locked in with a kind of stingray that wouldn't swim away even if it knew she was there. Slowly, Dr. Kowalski began blindly photographing the cell around her, stuffing each freshly printed photo into her pocket as the camera spat them out. Over the span of 45 minutes, she took a series of pictures of the entire cell until the film in the instant camera had run out. Danielle knew that she would probably only need one picture, but better to have more just in case. Luckily, none of her Foundation colleagues were around to tell her how insane what she was doing actually was. They were all preoccupied, preparing the site for its first official visit from the FBI. This all took place after what was known as the Broken Masquerade had taken place. Essentially, knowledge of the SCP Foundation and its research into the endless stream of anomalies it had contained was all made public. People knew the truth now, and the Foundation found itself in the one place it never wanted to be, the public eye. The organization and its activities were under the scrutiny of every journalist on the planet, and once more information about the SCPs and the anomalous world of the Foundation became known, the world would surely change forever. Danielle Kowalski knew all of this and told herself that everyone would need something for protection now. 
She only hoped her photographs would be enough. Fifteen months later, Dr. Kowalski was interrogated in her apartment by one Agent O'Brien. He and a group of fellow agents had barged into Danielle's home, demanding to know the location where a number of SCP-610 specimens were being held. SCP-610 being, of course, the infamous infection known as the flesh that hates, a disease capable of turning human beings into horrible, deformed monstrosities of flesh. Agent O'Brien and presumably whoever he was working for was intent on turning these creatures into weapons, and the man had little patience for a former Foundation researcher who wasn't giving up the answers that he wanted. Danielle tried to argue with the agent, citing the Berlin Accords Against Weaponized Anomalies, a motion proposed to the United States Senate that would forbid the use of anomalous objects, entities, and creatures as weapons for any country. O'Brien wasn't interested. He claimed that if the Kremlin and Russia had no intention of ratifying such a law, then America wouldn't either. The agent had his men grab Danielle by her arm, while he grabbed her right middle finger and began to push a thin knife under her fingernail. The former member of the Foundation tried to stifle her scream, but couldn't stop herself as the pain struck. As Agent O'Brien tortured Danielle, he told her that the Russians had all the information they would need about SCP-610 in order to turn the flesh into some kind of weapon. As far as he was concerned, the United States government needed access to those SCP-610 specimens to know exactly what they would be up against in the likely event that Russia used the flesh that hates against them. And only a researcher for the SCP Foundation, the former senior researcher on the SCP-610 project, would know where to find those specimens. You don't think it's reasonable for the United States government to want to understand what could be used against us? O'Brien asked as Danielle's blood trickled out of her finger into his leather gloves. <laughs> Hell, I don't care what you think we're gonna do with it. I want those specimens. When the agent finally let her go, Dr. Kowalski tried to catch her breath, forcing herself not to scream in pain again. She pointed with her other unharmed hand to her bedroom, telling O'Brien to check the bottom left drawer. She had placed a manila envelope in there, containing the only thing Danielle had kept since departing the SCP Foundation. Under O'Brien's orders, his man ransacked the nearby room and were quickly able to find what they were looking for. The envelope was presented to Agent O'Brien, who was no doubt expecting to find a file inside, something that detailed the exact location of those specimens he was looking for. So you can probably imagine the dissatisfied look on his face when he opened the envelope to find photographs. A collection of instant photos, all taken in a dark cell, with all of them depicting a tall, thin, humanoid creature. A being with long, dangling arms that almost reach the ground, a thin, hairless body, opaque, pupilless eyes, and a wide, gaping mouth. Furious to once again be denied the information he was looking for, O'Brien disregarded the pictures and burned Dr. Kowalski's neck with his cigarette. In his anger, he said, I think your foundation sure thought they were powerful hiding in the shadows, but I'd like to explain to you why you're wrong. The agent then went on to describe his time as a member of the DEA in the late 1980s and how he'd been involved in the hunting of notorious cartel boss Pablo Escobar. I had a narco in custody, every bit as uncooperative as you are now. The man had insisted that Escobar owned all of the Colombian law enforcement, but a young girl O'Brien had argued that if that was the case, and they possessed all this power, then why did Pablo Escobar's men hide their guns? Why smuggle drugs in secret, and bury their money where no one would find it if they really had the control they claimed? Much like Escobar's cartel, the SCP Foundation had always moved in the shadows, a power that O'Brien believed to have really belonged to the government. Your anomalies belong to us. Your research belongs to us. Your life belongs to us, he told Dr. Kowalski. Suddenly, one of the other agents noticed movement outside of the apartment. The second that Danielle saw a long arm face through her wall, with gray skin like that of a corpse, she snapped her eyes shut. O'Brien and his men drew all their guns and opened fire on the monster that had walked through the wall as if it wasn't even there. All the while, Danielle Kowalski kept her eyes shut. The sounds of screaming and snapping bones and a sickening slurping noise filled the air, but she made sure not to look. Within a few quick moments of panic and agonizing pain, it was over. The apartment was quiet, apart from strange breathing, like a mix of a frightening whimper and a death rattle. 
Run along now, 096, Dr. Kowalski told the shy guy. There are worse monsters in this world than you. Now go check out SCP-096 Shy Guy Escape Incident 096-1-A Containment Breach. And SCP-096 Look at a Picture of Shy Guy in Space, The Shy Guy Questions and Theories for more on everyone's favorite homicidal introvert.